The time is quarter to seven South Africa time and welcome to everyone around the world. We've got an amazing webinar lined up this evening. So we're going to ask Rail Levitt and Greg Blank to in fact turn on their cameras and join us this evening. So great to see everyone who's busy watching us. We have a huge webinar, unbelievable interest from South Africa and around the world in tonight's webinar. Greg Blank, I see we have, have the entire family there. Let's unmute you. I'm asking to unmute. You should see a button on the, your screen there. Listen. Greg, you're with us. Can you hear yeah, us? I'm with you. Just add it, my technician, my wife, to operate this for me. This is her computer, not mine. I so hope I she. I hope you you pay her well. I'm technically challenged, sadly. Eh? I'm an <laughs> older crowd. <laughs> Ray Levitt, tell us about that artwork behind you. And then we're going to do the same to Greg, who's got a man juggling a, a selection of chairs in the statue behind him. Well, what I must tell you, it's not my artwork. I'm actually in a hotel room in New York. So um, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's some flower, New York flowers and a, and a piece there in, in, the, in the room. That's, that's not a statue of yourself? Um, it could be. It could be. I think they, they're very they're like excellent customer service. So they quickly made a statue of me. Rail, I must tell you, I don't know what budget you're traveling on, but I've never seen a hotel room in New York that looks like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's uh, close to 19 to the dollar. It's all pretty expensive. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually all completely unaffordable. It's completely unaffordable. And Greg, you're, you're an art connoisseur yourself. No, no. I'm a, I was a pseudo art collector in better times. I loved art. I couldn't draw, so collecting art was a passion of mine. And I've done it through, through all the years. Collected, had it, sold it when I needed to, bought when I could. And it's just something that I've always been passionate about. So the painting and the sculpture we see behind you, is there a story associated with each one? It's just every, every bit of art that I buy was something that I liked. Whether it had an investment value, that, that, that was a plus. Now, the piece behind I've had for a long time is a Brasilia. Um, a very well-known French artist, just below sort of the top postmodernist. And, and the statue was an artist I used to represent, Isaac Kahn, uh, an Israeli who moved to Italy and did these most amazing sculptures, really fantastic work. And it just gives me a little bit of joy when you have a really shitty day that you come and look at these pieces of work, you know, and, and you feel good. And they, they give you great pleasure. Yeah, you know, Greg, and for uh, somebody says they're a pseudo-collector, you seem to know a lot. More than I know about the hotel room behind me. Right, yeah, I can tell you. That's a very impressive hotel room, Rail, I want to tell you. <laughs> so, I, just, so, I just borrowed it from somebody. Rail, tell me, you're wandering around the US. Are you on a book tour for this book? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, wish I, I wish I was. Um, although we've had about five sales on Amazon. So, no, I'm on a quick tour to I'm in Northern Atlanta tomorrow. Um, and then back to sunny, electrified South Africa on... Uh, on Thursday. Well, Cape Town will be much more electrified than Johannesburg. That I can yeah, assure yeah. you. One step away. So I, I, I want to know you both. You both have been in the book business. In that there are two books. I appreciate that. That uh, Greg, this one, this one was written about you rather than by you. And Rail, this one, which I must tell you, is a beautiful read. Um, and never before have I read two books in one weekend. But well, well, I, would, I, like, I don't know about. I know Greg probably retired on his author's royalties. Um, I, I would, that's retired. what's going to be my question: Is there well, money in writing books? Well, let let Rail answer the first one, and and I'll come. I'll follow it. Tamely, no, there, there is money. Uh, the money is just the cost um, to to the time and the, and, the, and the work that's required to do the book. So that's the only money. It's money out, not money in. Uh, I mean, it's quite interesting when I published the book, I asked the publisher, what, what is a, a bestseller in South Africa? Um, and they said to me, well, look, I mean, obviously it's fiction and nonfiction. So they said to me, look, if you sell 10,000 books, um, you'd be heading to the sort of bestseller list. I said, 10,000 books? I said, yeah, it's, um, nonfiction is not, a, is not a very well read environment, but obviously there's audio today and all the different forms. So um, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, we've sold close to 20,000 of these books. Though, which is oh, so you're a best-selling author now? 
No, I didn't say 10,000. Well, a bestseller, they said, is like 30,000. So um, I just have to get all my friends and family to go buy the next 10,000. Well, I paid for mine. I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> So, Greg, before you answer, just to the people who are joining us and watching us around the world, we're going to go live in about 10 minutes uh, when we formally start the webinar. But if you have joined us from around the world, welcome to everyone who's joined us. And uh, let us know where you're watching from, please. We uh, we have Rail sitting in New York and we have Greg sitting in Cape Town, although both of you guys are, are usually near the cold Atlantic. Um, so, Greg, tell us your, your book, in fact, came out at the same time as A Long Walk to Freedom. Yeah, it came out at the same, in fact, a week before. Uh, I was fortunate that I got Zebra Publications to actually do the book. I don't know if Rail had to pay for the book himself where he got a publisher. So where Rail was correct, it's very expensive. And, and as, as, as the writer of the book, I mean, my book retailed at the time for $79.99. Uh, the, 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 the writer of the book, uh, he got 25%. I got eight rand a book, okay, which then I donated that to the jail and the rest went back to, to the publishers. So, but listen, my book at the time was a pretty big seller, um, 23,000 odd books. And 23,000 is big. Yeah. Well, I was competing with Mandela. I couldn't compete with him. You know, <laughs> was, was I, 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 I want to know if Mandela realized he was competing with you. Well, listen, hard, I can tell you, but my book, I think people are probably looking much more for an expose of what happened in the stock exchange and, you know, how many other people were involved or weren't they involved. And quite frankly, that wasn't the reason for the book. Apart from being cathartic for me, it's actually a very, very nice story, provided you're not the one in jail, and how you overcome obstacles and hurdles and what the mind can do when faced with massive adversity. So uh, just be before we come on and we ask ask another question because Rail, you've also gone into audiobooks and you've read it yourself and I do want to ask about that just to tell everyone who's joining us we're obviously going to go live at seven o'clock but just so you know where people are watching us we got uh, Cameron Green watching us from Somerset West hello again and we got Renee in Bantry Bay we got Binky in Dallas we got Melanie in Durban uh, Robin says hello from Cape Town. A uh, hi from Rochelle in Durban. Uh, Sandra is in Cape Town. Let's see. Uh, Carol Marks uh, Felder is watching from snowy Montreal. Um, and hi from Shirley Borumwood in London. Hi from Vancouver, British Columbia, says Herschel. Uh, Nicola says Nicola in Cape Town. And hello from Ricky. But Ricky, you didn't tell us where you're watching from. And Rodney, I'm sure you're watching. So come, Rodney, tell us where you're watching from as well. And uh, we've got Janine Croc in Cape Town. Uh, you'll see people will be joining us from all over the world. The only people who don't join us, Greg, are the Australians. Because they yeah. refuse to get up in the middle of the night to watch our webinars. It seems so selfish. Listen, half well, my that's family that's the punishment, right? <laughs> well, I can tell you half my family's there, and I think they may, might have tried to stay up, but I think they can have a pass. They can watch the rerun. So Emily's in Cape Rod, Ingrid's in Camps Bay, Brett is in London, Ricky Lee's in Johannesburg, uh, Howard is in Cape Town, Della in Joburg. Uh, we've got John John in Pretoria, Nicola is in San Diego, Selwyn and Patricia in Cape Town, John Savage is in Cape Town. Rail, tell us. You've done yes. an audio book in your own voice. Was it? What is it like to read your own story? Because you have to listen back to this and you have to hear your own narration of your own life. Is it traumatic? Yeah, it is traumatic. I mean, Howard, obviously you in the, in the publishing business, you're probably used to hearing your own voice being recorded. Um, and I sort of had that being in the auction business for so many years, but it was harrowing. I mean, writing was actually quite easy because you know, if you make a mistake, you can go back and, and delete and, and redo it. But but when you said I used to sit in this like studio with these like earphones on, and um, and then you don't realize as you speak, you make a little mistake here, or you the wrong pronunciation. So I sat in the studio kept on over December, um, and it went on and on and on. And then I lost my voice like after two hours. Um, it was a hell of a thing. And then I, I discovered recently that there's AI today that does it will literally you can do one chapter and then it's it's it re it sort of can do the rest of the book um please but I, tell me you didn't use it. it no i didn't use it and i was actually the, the chap i did the audio book with um he said to me like i'll probably be out of business in like two or three years time and i, I did it the hard slog and then i re-listened to the entire book um 
because I, I was I was one of those. I wasn't an audio listener, um, but I've completely changed. I'm now audio. Um, in fact, I'd like convinced myself I read. I'm like I like the written word, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I, I started listening to how other people because I actually thought I just sounded boring. Um, and I listened to other people's books, and then I so, so then I, I did the whole book, and then I read it a lot of parts just to make it a little bit more exciting. So you'll you'll actually notice that Malcolm Gladwell has the highest differentiation in in audio tone. And that's yeah. why he's such a remarkable person to listen to. But they've actually done studies on Malcolm Gladwell and how engaging he is just by the ability to change the tone and the resonance of his voice as he, as he speaks. It's a it's an amazing art. But if well, you... I'm probably going to write then because my, my tone changes. I did at different times. So I did like one piece in the same, and then like in, in the same in like in the same paragraph, it will be like two months later. So. So, so sometimes I was tired and they're not tired. So you can actually, like, in the beginning, I thought it was a little weird, but I asked a few people and they said they'd notice. Um, but I had a, a, quite a vast change in, in tone. So you, if ever I would recommend a book that's read and narrated by an author, it is, it's actually Bill Clinton's autobiography. Yeah. And the man's voice breaks with emotion in part. And you get a real sense of the individual when you listen to the book. Because, uh, you know, uh, both of your stories are actually very emotional, very personal stories. And they're very different stories. And and they're very different journeys. But at the same time, like, people want to understand the pain, the anguish, the trauma that you went through. Even though, to be quite honest, it's none of any of our businesses. But that's the thing that actually draws us. We love a good story. Greg, do you, do you still feel in some way that when you walk down the street and people realize who you are, that you're in some way a cult figure? Far from it. You know, you know first of all, I mean, my story happened a long, a long time ago. So effectively, I was arrested in 91, went to jail in 94. And now we're talking about 2023. So when you look at it, you know, you're talking 29 years ago. So very few people remember who I am. But when I introduce myself sometimes, and I always say it's Greg, and they say, who? I say, Greg Blank, and they say, the Greg Blank. And I say, there's only one, Greg Blank. But far from a cult figure, I mean, what happened at the time was in my life, you know, a tragedy. For myself, I could handle it. I mean, obviously for my parents, that was my biggest regret. Uh, my mother handled it very well, my late father. More, more, of a, more of an issue, you tend to put his head in the sand. But I was brought up that when you're faced with the situation, you attack it, you don't hide away, and you go forward. And I think that upbringing got me through whatever I had to go through. But you know what, people are fascinated about jail, they're fascinated about people who can go through it. Because most people have done something wrong, they just refuse to accept it. And when I used to give talks, uh, at the time when the book came out, and I asked people in the room, have you ever done anything wrong? And no one put their hands up. And I said, well, have you cheated on your taxes? Have you, have you gone through a red rope? Have you done? And you realize how much people do actually do wrong, but they're not accountable. And, and I think my story is really about accountability. What I did was wrong, didn't try to whitewash it, and I faced the penalty, which uh, is not for the faint-hearted, I must tell you. I mean, so we're going to we're going to go through that in a lot more detail. It's one minute to seven, and at seven o'clock, we're going to kick off this program as we welcome people tonight who are busy watching us on Zoom and YouTube and on Facebook as well. And I think we're expecting a very large audience tonight. Well, what's the largest audience you've spoken to since uh, the book has come out? Um, since the book, uh, it was actually at the launch, about three hundred people. So. Um, so when, when we do five, six, seven thousand people tonight, it's not a big thing. No reason to be intimidated at all. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I was uh, for 20 years of my life, I stood on a podium. I don't think I would get a few thousand people. So, um, but I mean, this Jewish, Jewish to Aspen obviously is not all Jewish, but it's uh, it's pretty large. So, you know, here you're talking about people from all over the show. So it's, um, I'll try not to get intimidated. Well, you'll see that uh, David has just, just joined us from Orlando and Florida. Um, and uh, we've got Bernice Hart in the United Kingdom. And if you look through the chat, you will, in fact, see just all over the world people joining us. So the time, South Africa time, has just gone 7 p.m. 
and a huge welcome to everyone in South Africa and around the world. A big welcome to everyone who's in fact joining us this evening. I think we've got a really heartfelt and remarkable set of stories to tell tonight. And the important thing is that no one's hiding away from anything. You have a chat button in front of you. You have a Q&A button in front of you if you are on Zoom or if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube. Dylan is, in fact, there to bring your questions from Facebook and, and YouTube over to Zoom so we can have an honest and genuine discussion about the people on our panel this evening. There are two books that we're going to be recommending this evening. The one is an old book. It's going to be hard to get hold of unless you go into Amazon, and that's called Prisoners of Power, the Greg Blank story by Rex Gibson. The other one is Raoul Levitt's book. We're going to tell you all about it. It's called It Takes a Tsunami. And both of the stories that we're going to be telling tonight are recorded in great detail in these books. And we're going to be telling you where to get hold of these books. And I think you'll be quite fascinated and interested in the stories we're talking about this evening. But so tonight is the 147th webinar brought to you by the South African Jewish Report. As many of you know, we started this as a once-off event at the beginning of COVID to try help our community and to help South Africa get through the process of COVID. And we began with doctors and then psychologists and then nutrition and exercise gurus. And ultimately, it's led into a remarkable set of series now being watched 2.7 million times around the globe. So a big welcome to our amazing audience who join us and more importantly, who participate in these webinars. But the Jewish Report brought you, brings you these, and therefore it's really important to know what's on the front page of the Jewish Report this week. So Dylan, if I can ask you to bring up our front page of the Jewish Report, let's have a look. Don't forget, you can pick up a hard copy at your local Spaza shop or your supermarket, your garage shop, pick and pay, checkers, exclusive books, CNA, local butchery, supermarket. Dylan, I'm not seeing anything coming up on the screen yet. So, um, so Dylan, so the vote to downgrade uh, the South African embassy took place in parliament on Tuesday. And in fact, parliament voted by 208 votes to 96 to once again downgrade the embassy. It is a disaster for our community. Karen Miller of the South African Jewish Report, in fact, described it as a slap in the face to our community. Dylan, I don't know why you're scrolling. We're busy talking about the front page at the moment. So, uh, so please go out, pick up a copy of the South African Jewish Report newspaper. As we mentioned, you can get it at your exclusive books, your pick and pay, your garage shop, your shul, your local schools, your butchery, we're in about 242 locations around the country. Don't forget to pick up a hard copy. And if you can't get hold of a hard copy, don't forget that we're also available online. And you can go to www.sajr.co.za. You can go to the Jewish Report website and you can either download the entire edition or alternatively, you can look at each of the individual articles by itself. Dylan, please stop scrolling. No one can see what you're doing. Let me remind you of the address, sajr.co.za. You can go at any point in time and have a look at the Jewish Report newspaper. We also want to tell you about the next two webinars that are coming up. Next Sunday evening, same time, 7 o'clock South African time, we have the Mayor of Cape Town coming up. And you can go and register that, Dylan. I don't think you want to be on your PowerPoint presentation. Um, Come on, Dylan. <laughs> so anyway, we'll be sending out next week, we've got the mayor of Cape Town on how to build a world class city. That's number one. And the following week, Rabbi Hasdan has just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, an amazing tale of 14 frummers who are climbing up, climbing up or climbed up Mount Kilimanjaro, took a Torah with them, put on tefillin in the snow, ran a kosher camp as they summited the highest peak in, South, in Africa. And they're going to be joined as well by a rabbi who's hiked the Great Wall of China, climbed Mount Meru, and he's leading a, a delegation uh, a delegation to, in fact, Everest Base Camp later this year. So that's going to be on Sunday the 26th. 
the weekend before that, the 19th is in fact the mayor of Cape Town talking about how to build a world-class city. So don't forget to join us for those two webinars, please. And there will be one more before Pesach, which will be our Pesach webinar, which we'll be doing just before Pesach as well. There'll be lots of recipes. There'll be some messages coming to us from Egypt. And we'll certainly be doing an amazing pre-Pesach event as well. So with that, the time is now five minutes past seven. I'm Howard Saxton, and I am joined this evening by Greg Blank and Rail Levitt. Gentlemen, thank you for sharing your stories with us tonight. It's going to be a fascinating evening. We, we are not shying away from anything. If anyone has a question or a comment, you have a comment section in front of you, whether you're on Zoom, YouTube, or Facebook, put it there. We'll make sure that we can address all of the issues. And Greg, I'm going to start with you because I think the story we're telling about yourself is in fact an old story. It goes back 30 something years. Who were you before the crisis began? <laughs> Who was I? You're talking about in the beginning or do you want to fast track? I, I want to know know because in the 1980s, the name Greg Blank had legendary status. Everyone knew the name. There was this mythical stockbroker that was the coolest individual, the guy making all of the money on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And well, that was the name. Who were you? Well, let's, thanks for the send off, but not entirely correct. So I started off, went to university, uh, did a BCom, then I did an HDIP accounting. Uh, I was very upset to hear when I joined my accounting firm, Fisher Hoffman, that I wasn't the best accountant they ever had. I had my own accounting principles, which didn't go down too well. And as a result, I used to coach tennis during the day, and then you go to, went to university at night. When I realized there wasn't accounting material, I ended up going to the army, did an officer's course for a year, and spent three months in, at, in the border and nine months at, at Pretoria headquarters. I then came out and joined Standard Merchant Bank, where I thought I was a great merchant banker. After nine months, they told me I wasn't the best merchant banker either. And as luck had it, I was having a sauna at, at uh, the TAC in Kalani, and I bumped into Sydney Frankel in the sauna, which we won't discuss much further. Anyway, to cut a long story short, Sydney said, come work for me, what I want to earn. I was earning 375 Rand a month at Standard Bank, and I said to, to Sydney, I want to earn 1,400 Rand. So I went, had an interview, and they hired me. What, what the late Sydney forgot to tell me is that no institutions dealt with them at the time. So I had a job as an institutional trader. And the deal that I had at the time was that any business that I could get, I would get 50% of the brokerage, which was enormous. The only problem is no one would deal with, with the late Frankel. Anyway, after nine months and, and cold calling people every day, I got my first order. And funny enough, at the time, I was, I was the first person on the floor in dealer status who actually had a degree. So I had slightly more information than the average guy on the floor, which stood me in good stead. So one by one, I accumulated all these institutions and I started making some real money at the time. Uh, when Sydney saw what money I was making, he then changed my deal, as everyone does, and he reverted me to 5% of the income. But my private client base, I could get 50% of the comp. And I've been blessed my whole life to have amazing friends and who have treated me well, and I think I've treated them pretty well. And they all followed me and I gave them advice and what to do and what not to do. And however, you won't believe how many friends you have when you're making them money. You know, the trick is when you're not making them money, see how many of them are. That just fall by the wayside. But through whatever I went through in my life, my friends who've been my friends have been there and have been absolutely amazing. In fact, without them, I wouldn't be here today. So, I was making all this money on the stock exchange and got involved with these guys, the old mutual guys who came with a great idea. And I was used because I had the contacts. And at that stage, sad to say, the stock exchange was really, a, let's call it a plethora of everyone was doing something. That was incorrect. But because everyone was doing it, it wasn't deemed to be wrong. Until I seemed to do it and then all hell broke loose. And there was a group so of guys. So let's talk about the it. What is okay. it? What, what did you actually do? Well, well, let's just rewind. There were a group of guys from Ed Hearn at the time. We had 576 charges where they all paid admission of guilt. And they got off. So I, at the end of this day, the, the attorney general 
They didn't know, and I'll come back to Frank Kahn, who was Attorney General of the Cape at the time. They didn't know what to charge me with. At the end, they called it fraud of non-disclosure. So when you were a stockbroker, you couldn't act as an agent and a principal. So if you were selling stock that you had a share in, you had to disclose that you were the owner of that stock. So you couldn't take a turn and earn commission, which they have now made. In fact, they made legal six months after they ended up in jail. But at the time, that was wrong. So, and that's really what, why I went to jail, for fraud of non-disclosure. So let's actually, for those of us who are not on the exchange, take us through slowly. You had a client called Old Mutual. One of many. And and in fact, there was a criminal syndicate operating at Old Mutual, was there not? Old Mutual, the team involved in Old Mutual, we don't have to go, we don't have to go through the names. They've been doing this for many years. So effectively, what they would do, they were different fund managers at the time. They would look for certain blocks of shares. Now, if you know the way institutions work, institutions don't want to buy a thousand shares at a time. They want to buy 500 or a million at a time to make it easier. So what happened was they would say, we're looking to buy X amount of shares. Okay, we don't guarantee you that we'll take those shares, but there's a good chance. So when I got caught, okay, there were seven guys from Old Mutual who got off scot free and I was left holding the can. Of the 29 charges, only 16 of the deals went to Old Mutual the balance got sold into the market. But again, as I said, Howie, at the time, wrong, and you weren't allowed to do it. So I guess because there's so many of us, sorry, Greg, I'm going to go through this a little slower because because for those of us who aren't on the market, so for example, the fund managers at Old Mutual would come to you and say, we may very well be interested in share X. Let's, for want of argument, call it Southern Sun. And you you would go and buy up Southern Sun shares from wherever you could find them into an account at your own risk into an account. And when you had accumulated enough, you would say to them, I've got a hundred thousand Southern Sun or half a million Southern Sun. Do you want to buy it? You would offer it to the dealer. The dealer Mm -hmm. then would refer to, but remember at that stage, Old Mutual, their whole team or cabal was infiltrated all the way through from the dealer to the fund managers right through. I mean, sadly to say at that time, it was a wild west. And Old Mutual, Sandland, every one of the institutions were involved. Okay. Obviously, today, it's, it's a totally different uh, story. But, but then- in, our, in our example here, you would have accumulated half a million Southern Sun shares. The Old right. Mutual team would go and recommend to their bosses that they buy half a million Southern Sun shares. You right. would sell them the half a million that you owned or that right. sat in this account. And the profit that you'd make on the shares, ultimately, you would share with the dealers from Old Mutual. And that's if they took them, correct, yeah. If they took, if they took them. If they yeah, didn't, I'm, you would land up selling so to somewhere, someone let else. Let me make it easier for you, what, what happened in real life. If you go to the doctor, okay, and he says to you, Howie, I want you to go and have an X-ray at XYZ. Now, what happened, this is a true story, is that most doctors at the time had a share in those clinics. If they never disclosed that they had a share, that's called fraud of non-disclosure. It happens, it happens every day in every form of business. And people just don't disclose, sadly. That's exactly that, that that's to make it easier for people to understand. Yeah. So ultimately you would make money, the dealers would make money. Did it occur to you at the time that this was unethical and probably illegal? You know, the scary part is when you're doing it, and everyone in the exchange was doing it, you actually don't feel it's wrong. The first time that I really understood that it was wrong when I was sitting in my jail cell at Kruger's door. And then you've got time because you're so subjectively involved in the situation that you don't see it. But when you remove yourself from the situation and you understand what you did, you can see how clearly it was wrong. So it took that shock or the realization that you're sitting in a little cold cell that, guys, this is wrong. And I never ran away from it. You know, I made it very clear. What I did was wrong, even in court, when I spoke to the judge. You found me guilty. I made a mistake. I'm here to face, I'm, I'm here to face the penalty. Whereas most people, sadly, today aren't. Very few people are accountable, Howie. Yeah. So, so, Greg, how much money did you make out of this? Was this a very profitable thing, your share? Not really. Share of- I was the worst criminal I ever had. I made $1.3 million and paid back $1.9 million six months after... They told me what that what I, what I'd cost old mutual. 
Old Mutual at the time made 200 million rand from the deals. So I'd already paid back all the money plus interest to Old Mutual two years before my court case. So I really wasn't a great criminal. And I, I just want to talk about one additional thing before we move on with the, on with the story. And that is people got hurt. And the people, you know, you think you're dealing with an institution, you think you're dealing with Old Mutual, but ultimately Old Mutual is a collection of its policyholders. They're pensioners and people who depended on Old Mutual of making money. And ultimately, do you recognize that the victims weren't really the big institutions, but the victims were ordinary no. people on the street? No, but that's where people make, no, in, in my case, Old Mutual, who was the main, the, the main uh action or action of the case never got hurt at all they made 200 million rand for their clients okay but the people who got hurt were the people who sold their shares in the market not knowing or i don't know that that these shares could be sold at a higher price later on it's no different to the market now when you look at what's called insider trading you know the principle of insider trading is based on the fact that as if, as long as information is in the public domain it can't be insider trading Information not in the public domain is insider trading. Sadly, an efficient market only works on insider trading. So, you know, if, if you look around the world now, how many cases there are of insider trading and people that are getting prosecuted, but invariably it's not an individual, it's a company that gets prosecuted. So Goldman Sachs pays $20 billion in fines. No one's accountable. But insider trading is a crime. It's no different to holding up a bank, okay, because someone has to suffer. It's a zero sum game. So you know? now you're you're at home one night, it's just after midnight, and there's a knock on the door and it's the police. Well tell us what goes through your head at that well, moment. Well, I, I think what you gotta understand what happened was I was being interviewed the whole week before by the by the Attorney General of the Cape, Frank Carr. And when I sat in this office, Frank walked in and I looked at this guy and I've become friendly with Frank, you know. At that stage, he was pretty fat, smoking a cigarette. His shirt was out. I looked at him and I said, I've got no worries. This guy's going to be dead in two weeks. Okay. So the, re the reality was, is that he wasn't dead and he's still very much alive. And I just told him what happened. I spoke into a tape recorder. In my mind, I'd done nothing wrong. That's the first lesson I give to people. If you ever, if you ever face doing an interview with the police or the attorney general, make sure you've got a lawyer. Okay, so I was quite comfortable that whatever I did was fine. I'd come back from playing cards on Sunday night. It was about one in the morning and the bell rang and I opened the door and it was a guy called Colonel Max, Alter, Max Alkers and General Nolly Hume. Sadly, at that stage, the police were proper police and the Attorney General was a proper Attorney General. And they said, they just want to talk to me. I said, guys, come back in the morning. I said, I'm sleeping, it's late. No, no, I just need to sign something. But as I opened the door, they walked in and they said, we've come to arrest you. And my brother Vaughan, who was living downstairs in, in, in the bottom room, came out and said, what's going on? I said, Vaughan, I'm not sure, but I'm being arrested. So I said to the guys, can I go upstairs and change? They said, yeah, but we have to come with you. Then I knew it was quite serious. And they said, and your bail's been set at a million rand. So I said, not a problem, I'll get my checkbook. They said to me, you're not allowed to have your checkbook. It needs cash. So anyway, three in the morning, I'm at, I'm at John Foster Square, sitting there waiting for something to happen. I fell asleep on the bench. I woke up at about half past six, noise everywhere, and walking around behind the bench. And I went up to the, to the officer in front and I said, what am I doing? What should I do? He says, well, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. They arrested me, but I don't know what to do. They said, well, you can may as well go home. So I said, well, I don't know if I'm allowed to go home. So I phoned my late, uh, my late cousin, Raymond Blank, from Fluxman's, and he organized two girls to come and see me. And um, they said, no, you, you've been arrested, but you can go home. I needed to pay a million rand bail. Now, the sad part was, or, or the good part was, is that I had the money. But the bank that I was with at the time, I was there on Friday just checking my balances. And when I phoned the bank manager, to authorize a check they said well how do we know if your money's in the bank and the bank that said it i never deal with that bank anymore but that's the scary part how because when you're putting money in and it's going for you everyone's your friend 
as soon as you face a bit of adversity, everyone run for the hills. So I got home and the hardest day of my life. Now, I had that answering machine at that day and it was full, packed with just messages and messages and messages. So what I did was I dictated a message and I said, hi, it's Greg Blank. I might not be around for a while, but I'll call you when I get back. Okay. And that was it. That was the saga for the next three years. You know, the beauty is when I got arrested, I didn't have a charge sheet. Absolutely no charges. Took them 18 months to formulate a charge. Then eventually, when, when, when I was going to go to court, we had done a deal with the attorney general and the judge where jail wasn't an issue. The state wasn't asking for a jail sentence. And my, so my just, family- just before we come on to that, uh, I, I, I just want to ask a question. At some point in time, you have to tell your parents that you're arrested. That must be one yeah. of the most dif- difficult things you could ever yeah. do. If, if, if I have one regret, it's what I did to my parents. Luckily, at the time, I wasn't married. Okay, so it did make it a bit easier. But as I said to you, my, my late mother took everything in her stride. And for her, it was, we've got a hurdle. We're going to overcome it. How do we do it? My dad, late father as well, he struggled. For him, it was, you know, I was the eldest son. You know, what have I done? You know, whatever it is. But, you know, they both held their heads high but you could feel the hurt. And that to me has always been my biggest regret. Because remember, when you go to jail, which people don't realize, it's not you. Nine or 10 times you can handle it, the people that are left behind. And those are the people that face it. So, you know, okay, sorry, Howard. Yeah, so so just to get back to the story, you, you, you get charged. But in your mind, you must have thought, well, you know, everyone's done this. There have been people up on charges similar to this before. They've all paid relatively minor fines. There's no way I'm going to jail. I mean, that has to be in your head at that point in time. Well, so, so let me tell you what happened. We eventually go and speak to the judge. My counsel, the, the late Clive Cohn, at that stage, a junior counsel, uh, Gilbert Marcus, most incredible guy. And they did a deal with the judge. There's only one problem. The judge was silent. The state said, we're not looking for a jail sentence. They came out and Clive said, Greg, all is organized. You've just got to go to court and you have to plead guilty. Uh, no one knew that I was going to plead guilty. And he said, I said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm going to book for the health farm. Because at that time of the year, I used to go to the health farm every year in our Rustenburg. So I booked for the health farm, went to court. And believe me, Howard, court is not like you see on LA law. Huh? It's a cold, dark place. Okay. I had a legion of people sitting behind. Guys that when I used to go to the races, they all used to come and if I had one or two winners, I used to give them money. They were all sitting there waiting for a handout. Had my family, had my sister, both my sister, my brother was overseas at the time. And what happened was is when you stand up and, and I'll never forget this, the judge says, Mr. Blank, how do you plead? And I said, guilty. There was like a hush in, in, in the court, you know, because no one knew I was going to plead guilty. And the next minute the judge brings this hammer down and he says, the state has found you guilty. And I'm thinking, the state hasn't found me anything. I pleaded guilty because that was part of my deal. So when, when the proceeding started, the judge then said, Mr. Cohen, just to let you know, I'm a shareholder in Old Mutual. I've got Old Mutual Unit Trust. Do you want me to recuse myself? So we had a meeting and Clive says, don't worry. The judge used to be his junior. He's posturing for the court. It's all under control. That's when I learned. Be very careful that you take as your, as, as your counsel. And he said, it's all under control. Don't worry. Result, instead of going to the health farm, I've got eight years, okay, which is a bit of pull to swallow. In fact, when I got into the box, because the judge refused me leave to appeal, and my counsel wouldn't let me go into the box, and I said, I'm going into the box. And what happened was the judge said to me, Mr. Blank, how do I know you won't leave the country? I said, it's very simple, my Lord. You found me guilty. I'm here to face. I'm here to face the punishment. And by the way, if I wanted to leave, I could have left ages ago. I have an Irish passport. And I watched the prosecutor's eyes like, like wide open. Said, what do you mean? They came to speak to me after and they said to me, why didn't you tell us you had an Irish passport? I said, it's very simple. When you arrested me, you said, where's your Portuguese passport? All your Jews have, have Portuguese passports. So I said, if you asked me if I had a Portuguese passport, I would have said fine, but I'm an Irish one, so I didn't tell you. So that got me leave to appeal, and that took another two years. 
<coughs> and were you out of jail during this period? Oh, I was working again. You, were, you, were, you, were you back at Frankel Pollock? Uh, no, 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 no. I didn't go back to the exchange, but I was sharing offices with the late Dave Hershowitz, and I was managing people's money. And I had the, you know, the financial service authorities to come and check on me because technically I couldn't act as a stockbroker. So I could just give advice. That's all I could do at the time. But I carried on doing what, what, I, what I knew best. So till the point that from arrest until you actually physically land up in Krugersdorp jail, how long is that period? From arrest to uh, just under four years. And, and what happens to your life in that period? Very difficult, but you have to carry on. I mean, some days I couldn't get out of bed. I used to force myself to get up. I used to sit. I had a bath in, in my old house in Cabo Rock with a ledge. And I used to sit on that bath and, and put my head in my hands and say, Greg, you've got to move. You've got to move. You've got to get up. You've got to go. And I, at that stage, I always had exercise. And I started doing a lot of exercise, running and clearing my head. And I carried on doing what I did. You know, the difficult part was, is that everyone judges you. You know, I'll go to a restaurant and I'll be sitting, I'll never forget, the Longhorn in Corlett Drive. And they used to have these big booths. So I'm sitting behind the one, the one booth and I'm listening to the guy. And you know this guy, Greg Blank, and the guy saying, I know him so well and he's this and he's that. And I'm listening to these people talk about me. It's surreal. So I think I don't recognize the guy's voice. So I go up to the table. And I said, hi, guys. And he's talking about Greg Blank. The guy said, yeah, he's a big friend of mine. I know him. He said, I'm Greg Blank. So, you know, the scary part is, is that people think they know you. They think they know what you did, which is fine. Okay. But at the end of the day, you can only be true to yourself, no matter what you are. And that's one thing I've always been. If I've done something wrong, I'm accountable. And it's a tough pill to swallow. Because as I said to you, sadly, in this day and age, everyone blames everyone else. No one is accountable for what they do. And the sooner you take responsibility, the easier life becomes. So that was just pre joke So I have one question before we move on to rail. And after, after we've met rail, we're going to come back and talk about your prison experience because it's, it's quite a remarkable experience in itself. And my, my question is, when you find out you get sentenced to eight years in prison, what goes through your head at that point in time? Eight years as oh. a, as a, for a guy in his 20s is a lifetime. I was, I was 32. So effectively what happened was is the judge delayed my sentence to a Monday. So it was supposed to be on the Friday. So the whole weekend was crazy. It was just you let every dark thought enter your mind. What's the worst that can happen? Anyway, so we go back to court. Remember, I'm still comforted by my counsel telling me, Greg, don't worry. It's sorted. It's all going to be okay. And I'll never forget this. The judge walks in with two assessors carrying his books. And he says to me, Mr. Blank, you can sit down for this will be a lengthy judgment. So I think, okay. So he starts with saying, you're an officer in the army. You give charity. You look after your family. You're a lovely guy. And I'm thinking, geez, I'm actually an unbelievable guy. And by the way, I give you eight years. Then as soon as I heard that, the way my mind works, said, well, I've been in the army for two years. Okay, eight years is not so bad. A third of a good behavior, a third of first-time offender. I'll be out in just under three years. That's the way I rationalized it. Okay, because when you just hit with eight years up front, it's the end of my life. What am I going to do? So that's the way my mind works. You know, not everyone's cup of tea. Did, did you ever think, I do have that Irish passport? I could have gotten on the plane. I, I had the most amazing friends who had all said, we're organizing you a plane. We're going to take you out of there. And I said, absolutely not. I said, why would I want to be on the run for the rest of my life? I have to be accountable for my actions. That's the bottom line. And although going to jail is not on everyone's bucket list, for me, it was a great chapter in my life. It taught me a lot of stuff. Okay, once again, I don't recommend it for anyone. But it was part of my journey that I had to do. Okay, I mean, would have my life been totally different? Of course. Would have it affected my parents totally differently? Of course it would. But in life, you can't trade backwards. You have to go forward. Not dissimilar to rail story. You face with adversity. You have to go forward. Because if not, the alternative, not so good. Huh? You know, people think they're very tough until they face with the situation. 
And it's very easy, sadly, to say, well, I can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. That's the sad part. So, Greg, we're going to come back to you in a few minutes. We're just going to talk to Rail about his experience. And we're going to come back and talk about your prison experience, because that in itself is quite an inspirational story. Okay. Rail Levitt, you're sitting in New York. Let's get you un unmuted. Thank you for joining us this evening. Your story is a very different story. Tell us, I mean, tell us, tell us who you were uh, 11, 12 years ago. The king of auctions. I, I do know. I'm glad you can go back to my youth um, in Belleville. But um, I, I do want to say, I mean, I'm listening to Greg's story. Um, and in fact, I reached out to Greg in the sort of midst of my crisis. I'll, I'll get back to your, to your question in a minute. Um, and he gave me very good advice. And you can actually, I, I'm still like flabbergasted with his story. But at the time, um, I mean, now Greg and I hang out in Willie Point Beach front with our dogs. Um, but I, I hadn't never met him. And I'd read Prisoners of Power way before I had my issues. But I did reach out to him. And it's quite interesting, even on this show, a lot of my friends said, you know, why would you go on a show with Greg Blank? Uh, because you know, he went to jail and you never went. And it's a completely different story. But I, so, so it is a different story. But the fact is that Greg has an amazing story about adversity um, and which I learned from at the time. So, um, so, so a lot of like naysayers were quite surprised that I would even come on the show. Um, but listening to Greg's story and, and the humility and how he trade, because I mean, he, the party you can ask him was he became very successful post uh, his jail episode. Um, so to answer the question about me, um, 11, 12 years ago, I was at the top of the auction game. Um, and I'm most well known for, I was an auctioneer uh, from the age of 20, um, and it built up this auction alliance, which many people know. Um, Greg, so, looks much younger than you. Well, yes. let me say 10, 12 years ago, if yeah. you came out of university and wanted a job, everyone wanted a job at Auction Alliance. You were the player yeah. that everyone wanted to be, the person that everyone wanted to work for. I mean, yeah, I mean, we called it Jewish Economic Empowerment, and some people called it Jewish Sheltered Employment, uh, but I think it was more the economic empowerment. And it was a, it, it, it I had built up the business into being a, it was a market leader, 60% of all auctions in South Africa were conducted by Auction Alliance. And in many ways, I was the golden boy of, of auctions. Um, I had reinvented the industry, um, and uh, it was a big business. And it was it was always a business which it never had any bad stigma or any bad information around it. So when what happened happened, it was a complete bolt out of the blue. Um, it wasn't that, you know, for years, it's always oh, a gun, if he's a gun, if, and then all of a sudden uh, there was an auction in Stellenbosch. It was... It really was a hugely innovative company, um, and it produced a huge number of leaders. Um, in fact, today, if you look in the, in the property and auction game, I mean, many people went through that Auction Alliance University. So by the, by the time I turned 40, which is 10 years ago, so I'm giving away my age, um, over 10 years ago, uh, by the time I reached 40, it was at the pinnacle of its, of its success. And... Um, it had revolutionized, I suppose, the auction industry uh, in South Africa. It employed uh, 300 people. Uh, turnovers were about 5 billion rand. Um, and it was a large, prominent business of which I sat on top of it uh, as the founder and leader of the organization. And, Rel, did you make enemies along the way? Because when we get on to the, there's almost some degree that when things start to go wrong, a lot of a lot of the people you've dealt with in the past in the past almost come back to stick in the knife. Did you know you had made enemies along the way? I mean, I, I knew that I had made a, a lot of the people who didn't like me were ex-employees. Um, there was a specific moment at, at, at a stage in, in auction lines when we, we changed our remuneration models. It had upset people. Um, and I I sort of knew I did. I, I didn't think that they, you know, I, I think when the when Quinrock happened, it was just a, which is the, the auction of the winery, there was a configuration of events. And I think the, the people who are, who are irritated and annoyed uh, used the opportunity to firstly get me out of the market, which is really the, which is really the, the real modus operandi. Uh, but then there were people who wanted to put the, put the knife in. Um, I, I think one of the sad things is that when you, and it's, it's interesting, in South Africa, we've developed like a tall poppy syndrome. And, I mean, even when I wrote the book, it was quite amazing. There is 
you know, if you think if you're in America and you, you run a successful corner corner cafe or a general dealer, you'll write a book. And South Africa people are very nervous to write books. I mean, there's no Adrian Gore book written by Adrian Gore. There's no Stephen Cossett book written by Stephen Cossett. And so, you know, being a tall poppy uh, is difficult, and especially in South Africa of today. It's um, and and being a white Jewish male tall poppy just gives you no advantages. So. Certainly, uh, there were some enemies uh, floating around, um, of which there were ex-employees. Uh, um, but it, was I fully aware that it would come back in such a huge, significant way, which I sort of call my, the tsunami, the name of the book? Uh, no, I wasn't aware of that. So, Rail, let's start telling the story of Quinrock. Yes. There's, there's a British businessman comes to South Africa called David King, one of the most fam- famous... Uh, people in South Africa makes an untold fortune and doesn't pay his SARS bill. And SARS so, go so, and SARS go ballistic. So I mean, the, the, which is one of the ironies of, of my whole story because he was actually Scottish. So Dave King was was a Scotsman arrived in South Africa and started a company called Specialized Outsourcing. Interestingly enough, his his story actually starts at an auction. He bought an Irma Stern painting at an auction. It was a record price. He paid a million rand. And it attracted the attention of one Charlie Chips, Charles Chips was a chap working at SARS. And he said, but hold on a second. He looked at the tax records of, of, of Dave King and he said, but, but you've paid no tax yet. You've afforded to buy a painting of a million rand. And so, and so began this investigation into, into this Dave King. I mean, I, I had no idea who Dave King was, but SARS went to war with Dave King. It was a, it was a 10 year story. It was a, it was a criminal action against him. And the only asset which they ever managed to, to seize initially was, was one Lear Jets, which is, I think, in the UK. And then they got hold of this farm, which was, which was Quinrock. And uh, we were approached, uh, and, and this, is, this is now 2011. By 2011, as I'd mentioned previously, Auction Alliance was, was the big 600-pound gorilla in the industry. And SARS approached us. And, of course, I was extremely flattered that SARS would want us to do their, their big auction. And um, and had all the makings of a perfect auction. Now, now my whole career had been based on these very high profile events. So, so and and I worked it, and it's probably one of the mistakes um, which I which I had. And you know, looking back, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I was never charged with anything. I never had a chance, like Greg, to reflect. But we, in fact, auction lines capitalized on many of these very sad and difficult stories. And because you know, we were brought, we were like the undertakers of the business world. When when Legionet went bust, we would do the auction and. And uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, there, there were many of the insolvencies and the big bankruptcies of the of the sort of post millennium period in the in the nineties. Auction Alliance did, and, and and the one thing which I never actually gave thought to, which only recently, was about the the people behind it. And in, in fact, in the book, I, I write about a chap called Jürgen Hoxson. and um, and you know, I became quite famous by many of these people. I mean, Alan Busak and and his accountant to put me on the map. So I've been put on the map by many of these people, but. Dave King was 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 another big story and a big saga, of which really I was just saying, wow, this is going to be a, this is have the makings of another hugely successful auction, and and it ticked all the auction alliance boxes. It was in Stellenbosch, it was for SARS, it was attracted some of the wealthiest people in the country wanted to buy it. So it really was going to be the perfect uh, the perfect uh, auction. And in fact, I mean, I mean, I look back it's like one of the ironies on sort of December. The auction was on the 10th of December, 2011. I, I write to my colleagues and I say, we are going to end off this year on a bang because we have this high profile auction. I mean, I didn't realize that bang would be the last time I'd ever step up onto the auction podium, but it was one hell of a bang. Um, and, and, and how, so, how, about, how big was this going to be? How much was the property worth? Well, well that was one of the controversies. So, so Dave King believed, that, I suppose like many people do in those circumstances, he believed the farm was worth 150 million rand SARS believe, had, had valued at 120 million rand. And, and that was sort of the numbers that were being punted around prior to the auction. And, uh, you know, we, we had a, a meeting at our offices and, and SARS were like, we're not going to accept anything under, under 120 million rand for this farm, which, is, which comes into the story of, of, of vendor bidding or what the media called ghost bidding, because we, we had reached a point where SARS wanted a big number. And... Um, it was my job and our job as auctioneers to get SARS the number which they wanted uh, for that farm. And so the auction's coming up. You go, you think you're going to have a lot of bidders. 
And in fact, in, in the book, you tell the story, Wati Basson from Checkers is there, and, right. and, uh, and we've got Wendy Applebaum, uh, Donnie Gordon's daughter is there, who's got a wine farm fairly close by to that. You've really got some big names coming to auction. And what are your expectations when you get up onto the podium? How much do you think you're going to be able to get for this property? So, so when I get up onto the podium, I mean, moments before I get up onto the podium, and, and you know, these are one of the technicalities of, of ghost burning, of which I, which I was completely, in fact, there was a court case, which, which a chap by the name of Ali. We'll, we'll get onto the technicalities of, but, of but, this concept but, of ghost, ghost bidding in, in a moment. Yes. And you'll tell us how auctions work and give us yes. some advice for those of us who've never been to an auction. So my, my, my expectation was that we would reach around about 100 million rand. It was an extremely valuable farm uh, that was sold with all its equipment. I mean, they had spent... Uh, uh, King had really spent well over 100 million rand. I mean, the 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 the, the huge cost of the house. Oh, we were expecting about 100 million rand for that. That was the price that, that we were expecting. And, and of course, at that auction, we, we had very well orchestrated, well planned auctions. I had a list of the buyers. I had I saw them in my sheet, and you know, there it was. It was I mentioned in the book. It was Whitey Basson. It was a chapel in Alan Kaywood. Um, at that point, I had no idea who Wendy Applebaum was. I saw her name. One, one of the chaps had mentioned to me that that she owned a wine farm close by. And um, I was expecting to get a, a good price. And, um, and as I enthused to my colleagues, the year was going to end off on a very high note. Now, you'll forgive me, but I've always been brought up being taught that you can never trust an auction, that yes. all auctions are crooked. Yes. And so, that you have no idea who's bidding or what. Yes. I, I, and that's one of the reasons why I've never been to an auction. I've just always presumed that this is not necessarily a kosher way to buy and sell things. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, when you when you read my book, in fact, the one chapter is called uh, "Not a Business for Nice Jewish Boys," because my late father, who was an attorney, also believed that. Yeah? And when I said I'm going to leave university and finish law and become an auctioneer, he said, "Well, that's not a, a business for nice Jewish boys." But what auction lines had done is, we, in fact, we had actually professionalized the auction industry. And what had happened was, in the year of that auction, in 2011. Uh, they, they said there was never any reference in law to auctions. It, it was, um, and you know, I'm still today, I, I don't believe auctioneering is an industry. It's just really part of being an estate agent. Actually, it's just a, it's just a methodology of sales. It's, it's no different um, to an estate agent, except it's all done at speed. So what had happened in 2011 was they brought up the, the Consumer Protection Act. And, and, you know, again, one of the ironies, I, I sat on the board of the Institute of Auctioneers. I had traveled around the world looking at this complex issue of vendor bidding or ghost bidding or again what, what the media so explain explain that to us if i so, go to an auction is yes. everyone in the audience legitimate trying to buy a property or or are there people planted there by the auctioneers in order to push the prices up so the, the answer that in fact recently i, I, I was in london i popped into sotheby's auction i was with a, with a colleague and i said look I, I just want to point out to you these are the auctioneers bidding up the these are the people bidding up the price so the, the fact is that so a lot of people couldn't understand that and that was one of the, the big issues which raged and controversy during that period was if you think of it if you just make it simple, you think about how you have a house and, you, and your house is in uh you know wherever it is in santon and, and you want two million rand for your house so you tell the state agent look the price i want is two million rand if somebody comes along to you and offers you 1.1 million rand, you say no. You say I want, I want, you know, I want two million rand, and then they say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push up the price to 1.2 million, and so you go on, and maybe it's sort of 1.8 to 1.9 million rand. Said I will accept it. The auctions work in the exact same way at speed. So what auctions do, and they do today, and they did then, was that we would, we would put in people to protect that reserve price because many people who, who didn't understand auction thought, well, you know, if I rock up at an auction. And 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 the the property or the and could be artwork is going to go for ten million rand and I'm going to pick it up for a hundred thousand rand. Um, it's just not going to happen. So so just real to, sorry to interrupt you there. So so people understand the terminology. The reserve price is the minimum price that's that you won't accept. accept the, that's you right. won't accept anything below that. So why Perfect. don't you start an auction with the the minimum price for for Quinn Rock is going to be seventy five million rand. And let's see so, who's bidding about that. Well, funnily enough, if you if you look back at the videotapes at that auction, I did ask for 75 million rand, because that in fact was the reserve price which I was told by SARS and, and by the liquidators prior to the auction. So I did ask for 75 million rand. Now, the reason why you don't say, look, ladies and gentlemen, 
the, the reserve price is 75 million rand. Uh, it, it's, it's, that's the reserve price. The reason why they don't do it in South Africa, now in other jurisdictions in, in the UK, they're busy changing the auction rules right now. As we speak in Australia, you actually need to advertise that price. But in South Africa, it was a non-disclosed reserve because the fact is that if the liquidators got an offer of, say, 70 million rand, they, they wanted to reserve the right to accept a lower bid. And so what we would do is we would, we would start off on, on that reserve, which we, we call the anchor price, and ask for 75. If there was no further no bids, we would go back down and we'd start asking the floor what price you would accept, but with the proviso that when it was knocked down, that it would be subject to confirmation of the sellers, in this case, the liquidators and SARS. But realistically, you start at a lower price because you try to build up a frenzy. That's how all things exactly, work. 100%. No one's quite sure what's happening. Everything's happening really fast. Correct. But you try get the adrenaline up. You try get people excited. You try get people to compete against each other. It's yes. an adrenaline-filled competitive Correct. environment. Correct. And, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm no and longer... And somehow, in mm. order to do this, yes. you sometimes plant people in the audience who are not genuine purchases they actually sure. belong to you as the auctioneer no incorrect they belong they are the representatives of the seller to protect the seller's price and i think that's where, where many people got confused and i mean i mean listen I, again i made several mistakes in, in that particular auction um and the, the fact is that you can to this day right now every auctioneer has a reserve to, to bid up the price but again, it's, it's a word which we use, it's about disclosure. So you need to disclose that, look, we have the right to, to push up the price to the reserve, whether it's using somebody to, to push up the price physically or whether the auctioneer will just take the price. And it is, it is common practice. Uh, it's common practice today as it was then, but it's all about the disclosure. So, so in this instance, you have what is called a vendor bidder. Is that correct? Someone who's That's there... To I, I, who pays the vendor bidder? Do, does the auction house pay the vendor bidder or does the seller of the property pay the vendor bidder? Well, I mean, we would pay the vendor bidder a, a nominal amount to achieve to get to the reserve price. Okay. So you've got you've got a guy sitting in the audience or the the seller's got a guy sitting in the audience. Well, you, we've arranged on, we, we, we had arranged on behalf of the seller. So just and as, his, his job, can he bid any price or no. are there limits? That's, that is, the, you see, the, this is where the, the confusion came. And then, you know, the, the problem is in South African auctioneers, and that was one of our big mistakes, they were so opaque about this issue. So if you go to an auction in Australia today, they will disclose and they'll say, look, the bid is our bid or the bid's from the house. So you will actually know that you're bidding against the seller. But in South Africa, we didn't do that. And that was one of the mistakes, um, uh, which we did, but no one really knew the, who they were bidding against because it's, it's um, that happens. That happens at auctions to this day in, in South Africa and in many other places in the world. So you don't know that you're actually bidding on behalf of that of that seller's bid. But the the, the fact is that this, the the vendor bid can never go over the reserve price, and I think that's the critical area. And I think one of the the big issues with at Quinrock was that the reserve price was quite clearly stated to be for seventy five million rand. So when, when Wendy Applebaum bid 55 million rand, I mean, the media, even, even recently, they actually said, you know, Wendy Applebaum bought the farm, but she never bought the farm because the sellers, and, and Norman Klein was one of the liquidators together with Chapel and Clitor Murray, they had rejected her bid because it was simply 20 million rand too low. And our vendor bidder had been instructed to go to 75 million rand and no further. So, so now the, this auction happens. You're starting at 35. You're going in increments of 5 million. So you're at 40. Wendy goes 45 or, uh, or uh, your bidder, 50. You get up to 60. And Correct. your bidder, so, so your when, bidder when, the vendor bidder, but 60. Yeah. So when and, I got 60, and this was the number one mistake, of which I, you know, I, I'm aware and I take, take responsibility for the mistake. When it gets to 60 million, I think to myself in that like, instant, and you know, your life can change literally in an instant. And in that instant moment, I thought, look, we've got a bit of, of, of I have now my vendor bid at 60 million. I know the reserve is 75. So I think to myself, let's rather have this woman, I again didn't know at that point, let's rather get her in at 55. I knew her price was too low, but I, I thought, let's get her in at 55 million rand. But you're at 60 and you go to and Wendy go and back. say 65, and she says no. She said and no. then you say and 61, and Wendy says that's no. Right. And you're now stuck the highest bid. It's not her, a real bid. 
Correct. I asked her, will you go back to your bid at 55 million, which was her last, her last bid? And she says, yes. And then, so I retract the bid. And that is what, you know, she later says, that's when she smelt a rat, which she, you know, correctly realized, she realized that the, the person bidding against her wasn't actually a person who was buying. He was the vendor bidder. And I go back to Wendy and I knock it down to her. But when I knock it down to her, I clearly say sold subject to confirmation of the liquidators knowing that we were 20 million rand below the reserve. So, so now, Rail, if you had disclosed this all beforehand, if she well, knew there was, if if there ha, if she knew that there was a proxy bidder or vendor bidder sitting sitting in in the room, nothing you would have done nothing wrong. Correct. So so my, my but, big, but my you did big mis- correct. So that my big mistake was well, there, I mean, I, there was a multiple series of events, but but one of the big mistakes was it gets knocked down to to Wendy at fifty five million, and I'm well aware that it's well below the reserve, and it's never going to become a sale, which it wasn't. But the liquidator simply rejected that bid uh, a week after the sale. But when it gets knocked down, I do say subject confirmation. But when Wendy approaches my staff and then me, instead of saying, ladies and gentlemen, we've failed to reach the reserve, uh, it, it's uh, unfortunately, it is 55, but we failed to reach it, but of course, gone away. It just would be another day at the, at the races, so to speak, Greg. So, but, but I didn't. And when she asked me who was bidding against her, instead of saying, look, I'm really sorry it was our vendor bidder, I obfuscate. And, and in essence, I lie. I, I, I don't tell her who the highest bidder was. And uh, she then does an investigation, and then she uh, she gets extremely irate about this issue, I mean, naturally, and she realized that she was now bidding against our vendor bidder. So, Raul, am I correct in saying, if maybe you were less arrogant at the time? Yes. If you If you had gone that day, to of Wendy, course. everything would have changed. Well, again, you know, it's, it's one of it's one of the ironies, and, and and in fact, the irony is that Wendy herself sent me a, an SMS a week after the auction, and she says to me, "By, I mean, it's, it's actually so long there was no thing as WhatsApp." She sends me a BBM. I don't know if anyone's you're all too young to remember, but she sends me a BBM. Uh, she says, "Let's get together for a cup of coffee because this is going to get really messy." And because I knew the price was too low and because I was a little fearful of her, I, I sort of done my homework afterwards, I, re- I come across as extremely arrogant. And I say, look, I don't think it's necessary that we meet uh, simply because the price is too low. Now, the truth is probably one cup of coffee uh, later, the whole thing could have been resolved in three seconds. But it certainly, it certainly came across as arrogant. And because it came across as arrogant, it probably was arrogant. And so it was arrogant. And I think that's what sort of multiplies her her ire and her angry, uh, her anger at me because I, I sort of rebuff it and I say, look, it's, the price is too low, no point in us meeting. But one cup of coffee and it would have all been resolved. And in fact, your staff tell you at the day, like Wendy's really pissed, go speak to Wendy, you can sort this out. And yes. you, you don't take that opportunity. I don't. In fact, I tell them, I say to them, listen, leave it alone. There's no point in us having getting into a dispute over who was the highest bidder because our price is not going to be accepted. So just, just leave it, cut it out. And don't go go to see her, which was which was a huge mistake. So, Raul, before we get on to the consequences, and we're going to speak to Greg about his consequences and to you about losing the firm, it's important. Did you actually commit a crime? So the answer is I didn't. And what had happened? You did not. Is, I did. Is, I did not commit a crime. I was never. Were you charged? charged? No, I was never charged with anything. In fact, the truth is, when you look back, it was just a media story, and um, it's one of the. It's one of the issues which I live with. It, it was a, it was a full media story. I was I was tried, committed, convicted in the in the eyes of the media. Now the the first, it's a lot of people. You know, a lot of people even Google me and they go like, "Well, never found guilty of fraud," which was absolutely not the case. I've never. I've, in fact, when when I listened to Greg, I, I had never once went to court. In fact, the only time I ever went to court was when I tried to stop the independent newspapers from running the story. So I never saw the inside of a courtroom. I was never prosecuted. I was never charged. I was never even fine. But what had happened was Wendy initially went to the consumer commissioner and the consumer commissioner uh, makes a ruling. Now, consumer commissioner was, was designed really for, in South Africa, for people who've been ripped off at, at, at furniture stores, et cetera. This was a very high profile case for the consumer commissioner. She was subsequently dismissed, but she tells the media that she found me guilty of a mock auction. But from that, the story morphed into was Rail Levitt found guilty of fraud, which was, was not the case. She, she had no capacity to, to make a legal judgment. It wasn't a court case. 
And so the, the sort of public image was that I, I was this uh, fraudster who had defrauded Wendy Applebaum and, and she had lost money. But it, in fact, the, the sales never been confirmed. So no one lost a cent, um, not, not at that auction or any other auction, in fact. And, um, and uh, I was completely exonerated. But do you, do you concede that you did wrong, though? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I said in the book, I mean, I, I completely, I, I, I should have actually sorted it out with Wendy Applebaum. I, I should have immediately apologized to her, explained to her what happened, and I conceded what I did wrong. But I, I didn't do anything wrong legally. And I, I still am, I, I believe today, that the role of the auctioneer is to protect the seller's reserve price. Um, and the, the, the greatest irony of all, in fact, I was protecting the South African Revenue Services, which is the fiscus, so I was protecting them. Um, I was protecting. A lot of people would say, in that case, you deserved what you got. Well, probably, probably. But the, 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 and, and in fact, what happened was uh, literally a month after the auction, one of the other people who had come to look at the property bought it for 75 million. So it was sold to, to a Ukrainian uh, businessman who owns, uh, owns it to this day, Quinrock, and, and he bought it for 75 million rand. So th they got their price very quickly thereafter. So, Rail, we're going to come back and talk about the consequences of what happened to you uh, just yeah. after we speak to Greg about his time in prison. But you keep on referring to a book, and this is, in fact, the book. And can I say, brilliantly written, like unbelievable page turning. It, it's absolutely worthwhile. It call, call, it's called The Take Sit Tsunami. Just tell us about this title, because the book actually begins during the Boxing Day tsunami in Thailand in 2004. Give us a one-minute well, version. I mean, the real theme of the book, and I suppose the theme of this talk tonight, is really about adversity and overcoming adversity. And, and, and the fact is that we all have adversity in one form or the other. You know, we deal with a death. We deal with a career change. I mean, living in South Africa alone is just a, is a daily adversity, I suppose. And what had happened was in, two, in, in 2004, uh, I'd been in, in, in Boxing Day. Until I was in Thailand. I was caught up in the middle of the tsunami. Um, I, I was the last person to see a chap on the name of Morris Isaacson and, and his girlfriend. Many people may know Morris. His, his late father was Normie Isaacson. And I had lost these friends in the tsunami and I escaped death um, on that day. And the reason that the title of the book is um, that for me, I always believe I have had faced two tsunamis in my life. Um, the one was the physical, the real tsunami. And then the next one really was the media tsunami. And and the story is like really that the title of the book is it takes a tsunami to know what you're made of. And it takes a tsunami to reinvent yourself. And it takes a tsunami or it takes a very difficult situation actually to develop the adversities and the skills to navigate difficult times. Dylan, I'm going to ask you to please post um, a link to where people can get Rail's book. Uh, you can pick it up, exclusive books, uh, CNA, most bookshops, also available, I presume, on Take A Lot Rail? Yes, it is. For those, for those people overseas, is it available on Amazon? It is available on Amazon. And um, as I didn't realize, Greg, similarly, all, all the proceeds of our proceeds go to charity. So um, I do encourage you to buy it. And uh, yeah, it is, it is available on Amazon. And you can buy it in hard copy today. Anywhere in the world, they'll deliver you a hard copy. And, uh, and audio book coming very soon. Audio books out. In fact, I'm, I'm not sure if it's out on Audible, but it's out on Google Play and on all various other audio channels. Okay, cool. Well, Rel, we'll come back to talk about the consequences and whether you deserve what happened to you in a second. But Greg, you you land up, as we ask you to unmute, you land up in Krugersdorp prison, overlooking, in fact, the Jewish cemetery from your cell window. Um, let's try to get you off, off mute. Yes. Ah, there you are. Back. You're back. You're back. Okay, You're, so... What is it like for a nice Jewish boy to land up in Krugersdorp prison? Well, listen, going to jail is something which you can't really explain to anyone. The loss of your freedom is something that's just too abhorrent to, to really understand until, you, and, until you're there. I mean, what I did prior to, to going to jail, I used to lock myself in my room on a Friday night and only open up the door on Monday. That was my sort of jail training. You know, it's like when you go to the army and everyone's there to offer you advice, what to do in the army, you know, take change, do this, do that. I didn't have that many friends who have been to jail to give me that advice. You know, the only advice that I really had was, you know, don't bend down in the shower and take cigarettes trading, which I mean, for a guy coming from the northern suburbs of Joburg, who's never really seen a dead body, it, it's, it's really quite, it's quite petrifying. But you faced in a situation and you have to handle it. 
because if you don't, that's it. I mean, you'll be used as, as cannon feet to the rest of the prisons. I mean, realistically, you go to dinner in the jail and people get stabbed and killed in front of well, you at dinner. Well, I never. So what happened was, is that uh, the jail only has two meals a day. There's breakfast and there's lunch. And at lunch, you have a lunch and supper that's called the double dish. So the one and only time I went for breakfast, I was, set, I was standing in this massive hall and all of a sudden someone shouts up. Now, being in the army, you know, I'm used to responding to instructions. So I stand up. Lucky the guy next to me pushes me down. When someone says up, that turns into what's called a gang fight between the 28s and the 26s. And when the dust had settled, there were two guys lying dead. Okay, they'd been stabbed in the neck. So that was the one and only time that I went for breakfast. So the only meal that I used to have was my double dish in the afternoon, which was a stale loaf of bread, and they gave you a bit of honey. And you used to pour the honey over the bread and let it, and let it sort of feed through. And you have a wonderful meal. In fact, it's a great way to lose weight as well. I lost 10 kilos in the first three months. But, it, but it, it's a very terrifying experience, which you, you can't explain to anyone. I mean, to have your freedom taken away is just crazy. So one of the questions that's come, come through is uh, anonymous person says, Greg, did you get special treatment in prison? Obviously, no, definitely not. So what happened is every prisoner gets treated the same. Okay, so... It took me for the first two months, I slept in a cell with 78 guys, head to toe, and then I got moved to the hospital section. And at the time, I was trying to, to do things for the jail and getting nowhere. So after I'd come back from a shower the one day, which, I, which is another story in itself, I found this big guy sitting on my bed, who turned out to be a great friend of mine by the name of Felix Kramer. And he said to me, yes, the millionaire net. So I looked at this guy and he's sitting on my bed and I said, get the fuck off my bed because, you know, now I'm showing my bravado. The guy stood up, he's six foot six, his hands were double the size of mine and he just laughed and he said to me, I've been trying to get the recreation off the ground, he was in for murder and I'm getting nowhere, could I help? And that's how we started. It took me 10 days to get to a phone to make my first call. So, you know, step by step, I started bringing stuff into the jail in fact, Tony so Leon. Tell, tell, tell us what you did in the jail. I'll go complete about Tony Leon. But after that, tell us what you actually did to transform so, one of the most dangerous, violent prison in, prisons in South Africa into really the model for all prisons in South Africa. Well, Kudersdorp at the time was known as really the most dangerous jail. And what I did was with the help, not only myself, of two guys, Felix Kramer and, and Nico Sheffer became great friends of mine. We started the recreation. And what I did with my contacts and people were unbelievable, they started donating stuff. So we had TVs donated, we had soccer boots donated, we had soccer clothes. Whatever I could think of, I had wood donated, I had grain donated. Uh, Brenner Mills, they, they used to donate grain and, and, and maize for, for the prisoners. I had guys donating wood trusses. And I used to go out with chains between my legs and my waist to go and facilitate these, to these sort of transactions. So did I get special treatment? Definitely not. In fact, I was probably treated harsher than the other prisons because I was getting very powerful. The 26ers at one stage wanted to kill me. The 28s wanted to kill the 26ers for wanting to kill me. So it became a constant battle. And you can't take away power from any of the gangs. So what we did at the end, we had all the gangs working for us. So the 26ers, they did the trolleys around the jail and sold the ducker. The 28s used to monitor the phones. I put in 50 phones. I did a deal with Telcom where it would cost us 50 cents to make a call. We would charge the prisoners a rand and we would get the money coming in. So every general of the gang, because the generals control the jail, they were doing something specific. So what we did was, and again, with the help of many people, is we created the recreation. We had a band. So Alan Siegel says, do you remember Mike and myself brought boxing into the complex for you? Of course, I remember Alan very well and Mike. In fact, I'll tell you a lovely story where I had the late Nick Durant and, and Jimmy Abbott. They used to come on a Tuesday and Thursday and train the boxers, but we didn't have money to make a ring. So we bought tape and we got ordinary rope and you, know, you get that insulation tape. It took us hours to wrap it around, but it shows what you can do when you face with any adversity. And guys like Mike and Alan Siegel, and a whole host of people who I won't even mention, 
were unbelievable to me. And, and really, as I said to you in the beginning, I've been blessed to have amazing friends. And regardless of what happened to me, all my friends stayed with me because I've always been consistent. I get up every morning trying to be the best person that I can. And because I was in jail, that didn't change it. And it's, it's very easy to become bitter. Very, very easy. Because, you know, why did it happen to me? It didn't, should have happened to them. Why do I get sick? Why is someone not getting sick? You know, all these things go through your mind. And I'm just listening to Rail, what he said. In fact, there you go. There's a classic case of fraud of non-disclosure, which I didn't really think happened in that industry, you know, in, in, in the auction industry. But it's prevalent throughout industry, you know, and that's the scary part. But jail was a great experience for me. I know I don't recommend it for anyone, especially if you've got a bad heart, but it teaches you about yourself. It teaches you what you can do, teaches you to be humble, and it teaches you how to treat people. Everyone gets treated with respect because you're all wearing the same clothes. So did I get special treatment? Definitely not in the beginning. I mean, I was in a cell with the 78 guys, all smoking their dacha. I couldn't breathe, but you survive. You try to go to the toilet at night. There's one toilet for 78 guys. It's blocked. You go and have a shower. You've got to buy a shower knob in order to turn it. It's something that you can't comprehend. And not saying that I don't deserve it. I did at the time, and I made the best of a bad situation. And to this day, you know, I'm friendly with a lot of the generals. They're all they're still in Johannesburg. And, you know, they're proper people. You just don't want to invite them over for show to supper. But... Uh, <laughs> So, Greg, let's actually talk about what you did in the jail. As 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 far as okay. I know, the, you built a gym. You 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 built, built the Krugersdorp Health and Racket Club. I called it the Krugersdorp Health and Racket, and the late Reg Park used to come once a month, and he used to adjudicate for us. I had a whole lot of gym equipment uh, donated by Harry Fulhul, who was unbelievable. And slowly but surely, we built up this gym. I had bags made, I had shirts made, I had hats made, and gave them to the prisoners Okay, as and when they won tournaments. All I was doing was building up their self-esteem. Because remember, when you're in jail, your self-esteem is at a low. So by guys improving their body, looking good, they came to the gym. The next big thing which I did uh, was something called Black Like Me, which was run by Herman Mashaba. And there we set up a hairdressing suit. And, and I became very familiar about, you know, black hair, you need to relax it. So all of a sudden, I'm becoming a pseudo-expert on, on hair hair relaxers, colored. So when the prisoner's family came to see them, they looked unbelievable. And I digress. I was with Herman at the Met uh, three weeks ago, and he was a great, great supplier to us of his product. And he came up to me and he said, Greg, I haven't seen you for a long time, but I want to tell you a great story. He was doing his rounds for his political party in Davidson, and he walked into this barber shop, and the guy said to him, I owe you my life. The shop is because of you. And Herman said, I don't know who you are. What are you talking about? And he said, when I was in Krugersdorp jail, Greg Black helped me with this. And that's what we did. We set up a black like me. We had a band game. We had soccer game. Kaiser Chiefs, Joe Masoma brought his team to come play with us. We had a proper event going on. I call it emotional blackmail. Because when you give something to someone who's got nothing, you can control them. Okay, I know it sounds a little bit sort of you know, aggressive, but that's what it is. We had TV sets in all the sections. We used, we used to send out a signal of videos every night. Used to get there from Krugersdorp West. And then if they didn't like the video, they'd be queuing outside my door saying they didn't like the video. And I'm saying, guys, if you don't like it, I'm switching the signal off. So it's the same as anything in life, okay? If you give somebody something and you take it away, it's a very strong weapon. When they've got nothing to lose, you can't control them at all. And that's what jail's about. It's about but you, you 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 even go further. I mean, you you set up or like a, a sewing fashion school. Oh, within. we had everything. We had sewing. We had guys made. We had twenty one different businesses. When I call them businesses, going on just to keep the prisoners busy, because as I said to you, when I got there, it was the worst prison in the country, and for all the work that I did, I got the Red Cross Meritorious Award, which I know sounds crazy, for helping the prison. We had a guy painting the walls. I used to take other, other, other officers around and show them the jail. You know, we had this courtyard, which we had a special tuck shop, and then we put tuck shops in every section. 
So it became a big business for us. And I had my friend, Nika, he was in charge of, he was the cleverest guy that I've ever come across. He organized, he did all the books for us. In fact, to tell you a story, I digress. At one stage, we owned every prison shop in the country. We got the tender. Nick had found out that there was a tender going out and no one applied for it. So we applied. It took them nine months to work out that we actually had, had all the prison shops. So we had to give them up. But I mean, it was, it was a great experience, not to be repeated, okay? But it was my journey. And, and you know, very humbling, I can tell you. It's, it's, it's something which, you know, stays with me forever. But I live with it and I don't hide it, you know. And even when I got out, you know, I listed a business, couldn't be a director, had to be a consultant. And you learn about ego. Ego destroys. That's so, the first thing. So, Greg, you, you told us earlier, or at least you alluded to, that while sitting in your prison cell, you actually, for the first time, really understood the consequences of what you had done wrong. Well, it's the first, because you never really, when you're working with a whole stock exchange doing something, that is wrong in, in one form or another. You're part of that. You're part of the situation. When you remove yourself from it, you can actually realize what you did was wrong. It's no different. You'd see in jail, you'd have the grandfather, father, and son all there for motor theft. That was their, that's what they did. That was their play in life. That's all they knew. The stock exchange at the time was a culture of everybody, everything doing. You know, there wasn't transparency like there is today. You know, there was no internet. We were writing prices on. There were still prices coming through with ticker tape and faxes. It was a totally different story. Now everything is transparent. Still doesn't stop what goes on, but it's totally transparent. And so, so Linda Gross says you were going to mention Tony Leon. What was the connection? Well, so I'll give you an example. So Tony came... To jail. I was very friendly with Tony at the time, and he was an amazing ally. And he came and he brought me a cake to the jail. And at that stage, you know, Tony was he was a big deal, head of you know, head of the DA. And they called me and they said, "Mr. Leon's come and he's brought you a cake." Now I had to act very subversive, so I tried to speak Afrikaans, and I wasn't bad at Afrikaans, but I kept calling the cake a cuck. I said, "Mr. Leon had brought me a cuck and a cucker and." And they started, you know, it was their job to make me feel that just belittled you because power has got nothing to do with money, but had, what they had on, what had on their shoulders. And that's where people, Tony was very powerful and he got into the jail. The warders or the commandants of the jail, they were the beginning and the end of everything because they controlled my destiny. So they made me feel as little as one could be. They totally denude you of anything. And that's where I learned a fantastic lesson is that whatever ego you have, and we all have ego because it's what we thrive on, get rid of it. And that's has stood me very well, you know, in what I do in life. I, I sent you a link a few weeks ago of the webinar we did with Michael Medrick, the Correct. largest drug bust in US history. And you said you don't think Michael would have lasted a day in a South African jail. Well, you know, I, I listened to his story and and you know, first of all, an amazing story, you know, and, and no disrespect to Michael. Uh, what came across, and, and, and I don't know him from a bar of soap, but it sounds, I mean, must be a very intelligent man, is that almost like he had no remorse, like no humility. You know, when you listen to that story, when his girlfriend came in and threw on the table, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, I don't care who or what you are. You just don't do that in jail. You know, in our jail, you couldn't do it. I mean, the closest I came to that was Rabbi Nochem Cohen. He came to visit me with his whole team because before I went to jail, Nochem had come to see me with his book. It was a sudur. He said to me, Greg, and he can't speak English, he says, not one day. I said, this is unbelievable. So when he came to see me, I said, Nochem, I said, you were correct. I didn't get one day. I got eight years. He says, don't worry. How much can you give? You know, it's just those little stories keep you going. You know, so, you know, if you're talking about Mike May, I mean, unbelievable story, but you couldn't do that in, in our jail. There's no way your girlfriend could walk in. You can throw in a table and have, how's your father with it? I mean, not you, a hope in hell. There was a part mentioned in your book, and once again, Prisoners of Power by Rex Gibson. Uh, amazing, amazing read for those people who haven't uh, read it. And I'm going to ask Dylan as well to post the link. 
uh, onto the chats on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube so people can, can get access to it. Uh, and one of the rabbis says to you, God doesn't give you challenges you cannot, uh, cannot uh, deal with. I was the chief rabbi of Krugersdorp at the time. I still have the Sudur, which is now in about 14 pieces. I've tried to stick it together. He said, God will only give you what you can handle. And I said, Rabbi, do you think you'll give it to someone else now? Okay. Because that's, you know, it's a great, you know, and I'm, I'm not religious. I try to be a traditional Jew. And I learned early on to be a good Jew. You've got to be a good person, which I try and do. Okay. And you learn from, you know, he used to come and do us the teaching of our fathers at the Kayavot. So every Friday he used to come. Then we used to get into an argument and then when eventually we start coming. But, you know, that was sort of, there were four Jews out of 2,200 prisoners. You know, and that was our lifeline, you know, to some sense of normality. So, Greg, before we return to Rail and ask Rail about the consequences that he faced of, of his actions, um, there's always the story told that says, Greg Blank, oh, he went to jail, he took the fall for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Can I, am I entitled to ask you the question? Of course did, you you know. did you take the fall for others? Definitely. Listen, first of all, it's, it's no one's business, but definitely not. I can assure you, if I had the chance to turn state's witness like the other six old mutual guys had, in a heartbeat. But that's not in my nature. What I did, I did. No one else was complicit. And it was my fault. So I had to pay, you know, I had to do the time for the crime. But that's what I'm saying to you. People have always got a comment to make. Greg Blank took the fall and he got looked out of. Please believe me, there's not enough money in the world, Howard, that can make you go to jail. When you lose that freedom, when you stand to a gate and you're saying, donkey heck, you're talking to a gate. I mean, you're like an absolute idiot and you're waiting for someone to respond. I mean, when I got out of jail, my old house in Kabara had the steel gate, which I used to open to go outside. Sometimes I used to stand for five minutes at the gate waiting for someone to open it. There's not enough money in the world that can, that can make someone go to jail or you take the rap for someone, especially not in South Africa. In, in retrospect, I mean, you've reconciled to your own guilt. Do you believe you deserved what you got? Ultimately, you spent 20 months in prison. Uh, 22 months. Don't, don't 22 sell it. months. Listen, what I did at the time was wrong. Did the punishment fit the crime? If you read every article, clearly not because I paid back everything plus. And in any, in any fraud case, everything is about restitution. But the judge made a decision. Did it warrant it? In his mind, he did. it did. And you accept it. That's why I'm saying you can't have any regrets. You know, everything in life is cause and effect. What you put in, you're going to get out. I put in the wrong formula and I got out something that really wasn't fantastic. But I firmly believe that what it did do, okay, was make me stronger for what happened later on in life. That's all. So, of course, I regret it. It's not even a discussion. When we come back uh, in a few minutes after sp having spoken to Rail, we're going to talk about your life after prison, how you've gotten your life together, how you've bounced back, and also your struggle with cancer, because you've, you've spent a long time very successfully, thank goodness, uh, strugg struggling against cancer as a disease. But before we do that, Rail, Let's talk about the consequences of, of your actions. How did it play out for you? Well, what happened was the, the, the whole empire disappeared. Um, and in fact, the, the, the story only started, took place like actually a few months after the auction. And in February of 2012, the story mutated from being just an auction into the sort of large ghost bidding scandal which hit the front pages of the newspapers. And I mean, you know, certainly when I listen to Greg's story, I, in, in a way it sort of pales into insignificance. But for me, my entire universe um, disappeared. And, you know, I, I was, my whole identity was being an auctioneer and being a CEO. And suddenly I, I felt cast out, rejected, dejected. Um, I, I went through rough moments. And it wasn't so much the financial loss, which for me was huge. But it was really just that suddenly falling out. I remember one of the advocates said it. It's like you'd fallen out of the top floor of a 20-story building and landed on the ground. Um, and so for me, it, it, the, 
uh, and a lot of it actually, you know, I saw one of the questions which popped up in chat. What are the tools which you use? But for me, and, and you know, what I do for me, it was a lot of it was in my own mind because I felt I actually felt like a criminal. Um, and the, the irony, I wasn't in charge. In fact, Wendy Apple only laid a criminal complaint against me in June of that year. But from the moment the story hit the newspaper, I, in my own mind, I felt as if I, I was a criminal. Um, I became quite paranoid at, at times. I would drive out of my flat. I was, and I'd read Greg's book. I was like waiting for that knock at the door uh, in the middle of the night. And, and yet, in fact, there wasn't even actually a traffic. I didn't have a traffic fine, uh, which which I had to account for. But for me, the the whole empire disappeared, and with it, my name and reputation. And it, it was quite devastating. And and for a long time, I I I, I felt sorry for myself. Um, and I went through emotions which many people, I imagine, would go through. I felt. It was unfair. You asked Greg the question, was it, did he feel it was unfair? Uh, then I thought it was unfair. I've subsequently changed my mind. I think the, the number one tool I suddenly realized one day, I, and I tried medication. I went I went on, on, on antidepressant drugs. I went to a counselor. Um, and then one day I just decided that we, we, we control our own attitude. And it's really just, the, and I sort of looked at my life and I, I wasn't facing a, a, a jail cell. And I thought, look, I just have to reframe the way I think about this. And instead of like seeing myself as a criminal, I started seeing myself actually as a survivor. Um, and uh, so, so for a while, I didn't do much. Um, I floated around. I think, Greg, you know, I share some things that I had amazing friends. You know, they so say your, your best friends are your friends that you make at the age of eight years old um, because, you know, they're not the ones who are really looking for something as you grow in business. And so I had a huge support group. Um, people have asked me, and I, I do want to say, like, how was the Jewish community? And uh, to me, in fact, the Jewish report asked me this question recently. And I, I can I can actually say that I found far, people is you know people in these scenarios go like, oh, you'll find out who your real friends are. And people be so terrible, but actually, and I, I think Greg listening to you probably found the same. I actually found some amazing people who I didn't know before. Sort of saviors arrived, and 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 I looked at it that way. I took the positive out of it. I said, it's wow. It's like. It's amazing to be part of a, a community who was actually, I mean, of course, there were people, and I'm going to look at some of the chat, uh, you, know, you know, Jewish people like to skin and gossip, and I was certainly dinner party conversation. And for a long time, I couldn't cope with that. I, I was, I wanted to be anonymous. I didn't want anyone to know my name. I, I went to study overseas um, to sort of disappear. But I, I changed my attitude. And, and I decided that my obstacles will become my opportunities. Um, Sort of, I, I love that Steve Jobs quote. He said, like, you know, when and obviously his was a different circumstance, but he said when he was sort of thrown out of Apple, it was it was the chance to rebuild them by myself. And it was a chance for me to try something new and to rebuild myself and, and really to, to learn how to deal with adversity. And you know, when when even when COVID came, for me it was like a it was a it was a walk in the park. It was like, okay, I've I've seen this adversity before. Um, but the, the consequences were dire. The the investigation, you know, it's like Greg saying that, you know. Greg just spoke about sort of the attorney general today to the NPA. I mean, the NPA gave it a full go with me. They, they weren't benign. Um, in fact, the, the, the prosecutor who's prosecuting Jacob Zuma was, was dealing with my case. They, they did want to make an example of me. And the investigation went on for 10 years. In fact, it was only last year when I got a letter from the NPA, which they said, look, they found no sign of criminality, that there'd been a, a case which had exonerated me. Um, but uh, for 10 years, I, I was unknown whether I would get that knock on the door. But but despite that, halfway through, I, I, I rebuilt a whole new career. Um, I, I rebuilt myself. And I, and I and, and certainly when, you know, you talk, uh, Greg talks about humility. I mean, if, if you don't go through those circumstances and learn true humility, um, and, and, you know, and I've, I've read a few comments and people say, oh, you know, it's, um, uh, rarely with this and rarely with that, and, and Greg didn't. People are very judgmental. Uh, it's very easy to sit there and, and, and you know, make a decision. Um, and, and I write in the book, you know, I, I was the man in the arena. I, I chose to be in a senior position. Um, I, I had many people working for me. Uh, people spoke about ghost bidding. I always thought it was unfair. Why, why were the other 300 people in our board of directors? No one ever pointed a finger at them. But then I realized I'd chosen to be in, in the limelight. I'd chosen to be in a leadership position. And, and truth be told, I would choose, I mean, certainly no one wants to go through difficult circumstances. But when I look back, the lessons I learned, the adversity which I, I, I overcame, um, 
in many ways, it's like I feel that I needed to learn those lessons uh, to go forward in my life. And and I, you know, thank God I didn't land up in, in a situation like Greg in, in the Krugersburg uh, Dorp Jail. But certainly, I, I feel that um, that that adversity had equipped me and uh, and it equipped me with life lessons which which I can use it. And it was one of the reasons I actually wrote the book to get to say that you know we can all overcome adversity, no matter what that adversity is. Terrell, I want to talk about to you about the media because there was a media persecution of you, yeah. and I, I I've seen people have asked the question in the Q and A section. There's this very famous moment of Devi from Carte Blanche rings yes. your your doorbell, and yes. tell tell us what people believe and tell us the story. Well, I mean, you know, one of the, I mean, it's it actually, you know, at the time, it was so inconsequential. In fact, I, I was quite amused by it. So w- what had really happened is one of the things that people remember is that uh, carte blanche had, had been looking for me. I, initially, I said I'd come on the show and then I wouldn't. But what had happened in the, and there was, carte blanche really went to town on the story. And um, and if anybody knows carte blanche and they, they take carte blanche as being sort of fact and verbatim, uh, I think they really are a misconceived. I mean, carte blanche is really sort of tabloid journalism. So, so what happened? They'd came, come to my house and they'd rung the doorbell. And I encourage all anyone who's listening tonight to go, you can people go listen to it. You just Google it. And you can clearly hear it's not my voice. But but what happens is they they, they ring my doorbell and I had a chap who worked for me in Zimbabwe and his name was awake. In fact, I wasn't even in town that day. So I'm, I had really good, I'm not that it was a legal match. So they ring my doorbell and they ask, Hi, is Israel ever there? And uh, my, my Zimbabwean chap, who, who he wasn't quite sure, he said, hold on a second. He wasn't quite sure what to do. He says, hold on a second. And he comes back and he says, no, sorry, uh, Rail Levin is not here. But what carte blanche does is they say, and look how the accent changed. So the Im- implication was that I was putting on the voice, which was really the, the, was, was really the narrative that they wanted to create. The narrative that I was like this crook, ghost putting crook, and I would change my voice. And so they went to town on the story. And... Um, you know, Debbie from Carte Blanche says, and I went to Rail Levitt's fancy schmancy flat, and he thought he could. She actually only said it later, by the way. Uh, he thought he could evade because he changed his voice. So here is the facts, uh, Greg. You gave the facts about you take the fall for anyone else. It was not me. Um, uh, you can go listen to the thing. It wasn't me at home. Uh, in fact, even the other day, quite a well known business lady tweeted and she said, Oh, I wonder if Rail Levitt's gardener was there. My, my Zimbabwe in a chat who worked for me was completely horrified because I mean, he had thought. He had sort of ruined my life. Um, I the take a lot. Did they ran a spoof? I mean, I used to like drive in my car, and they're like, "Ding dong, hi, is it Rail Levitt? And then I go, "No, no, it's not." And they go, "We've got a free book for you." And then they say, "Okay, come in." And um, so I was careful of doing that accent. So they went to town on the spoof. Um, it was absolutely not true. In fact, it was. I was I, initially I sort of laughed it off, but it, I, I wanted to sue. In fact, uh, carte blanche and. Uh, my lawyer said to me, okay, listen, Brew, just chill. I mean, you've got bigger battles to fight than this one. But uh, in fact, I wanted to see take a lot because I'm the only rail levered in the world. So they use my name for a lot of trying to advertise and, and sell a lot of books uh, through it. But to answer the question, it was not me answering the door. Um, and if anybody goes and listens to it, you clearly hear it's not my voice. <laughs> Do they take a lot, deliver your books? They don't just uh, advertise yes, on your voice. Yes. <laughs> so, so. Greg, if you can join us again, because uh, and let's unmute you once once more, because let's talk about your last post scandal, because we've been through. Like, you both got, have been through hell and back. Whether you deserved it or not, the people watching will will judge. As as uh, you know, we judge everything. Ralph, keep yours on because this is going to be a discussion. But Greg, what has your life looked like since you came out of prison? Well, well, first, before we even start, I resonate with what Rail says, is what happens to your life and how you feel from one minute you're at the top to you at the bottom. So when I got out of jail, and, and it wasn't an easy transition because I was supposed to come out two weeks before and there was a hell of a hell of a loo in, in the press. And what happened was is that they revoked my parole, which if you talk about a, a, a dagger going through your heart, that's what it was. And for three weeks, I just didn't know when I was getting out. I thought I was never getting out. Then they woke me up at four o'clock in the morning and the commandant said, you're leaving. And I said, do me a favor, wake me up at seven and I'll, I'll leave then. He said, no, you've got to go now. So that started my release from jail. I uh, left Krugersdorp at about 6.30, seven o'clock. It was already on the news that Greg Bank's been released. I get all the way home. My house, uh, my late friend was staying at. So I went back to my parents' house. 
and I get a call. I hadn't signed certain papers. I had to go all the way back to Krugersville. So anyway, that started my long journey back into, into let's call it the real world. Um, once again, you know, I hit the ground running. I started working almost where I left off, um, but with a little bit more humility and probably a little bit more street smart. And slowly but surely, I rebuilt what I had. And with the help of a late friend of mine, Hilton Kramer, we listed a business called our OTA Financial Services, which um, we raised about one and a half billion rand, which I was fortunate once again to all my friends who supported me that came to support again. And the listing was, was pretty successful. We bought a shell at four rand, the shares came on at eight rand. And for a while, it was a great success. I could only be a consultant, but by virtue of that fact, I was still part of the team and happy to be there. So we listed our OTA, we carried on, we had a whole lot of other businesses in it, and eventually had a fallout with our existing partners and they bought myself and the late Hilton out. And I started doing my own thing. Uh, successfully, unsuccessfully trying to play the market. You know, everyone thinks you're a golden boy, whatever you know, or you don't know, please believe me, I lose just as much money as everyone else. And it, it, it's been a bumpy ride. But, you know, some good investments, some bad investments, some great deals, some bad deals. The, the bottom line is I'm still here. You were involved in Techie Town, weren't you? Well, Techie Town was originally the deal that I'd put together for Brom. We sold to Actus, uh, which was the most amazing deal. I mean, Actus were amazing people to deal for. Uh, Brom, very, very smart individual and very tough. And he told me the price that he wanted, which was at that time was a 13 times multiple, which was unheard of. But he had a fantastic business and well deserved. The second part of Tacky Town, sadly, was a Steinoff, and that's a whole different story. I was very friendly with, with Marcus at the time, but that didn't go according to plan. But in life, you can't trade backwards. You've got to you've got to deal with the cards that you dealt. And that's what I did. You know, and since coming out and moving to Cape Town, I've been fortunate enough to put some real good deals together, which does help. And once again, I'm not, an, I'm not a great accountant. In fact, I'm useless. I can't do legal work, but what I am good with is people and assessing people and understanding them. That's all that I can do. So in, in my limited sort of world, my skill is understanding people. And, that, and that's really my, my, I suppose my blessing. You know, Greg, we're going to come back in a few minutes after we've spoken to Ralph, and I want to talk to you about two things. Number one, I want to talk to you about your battle with cancer, but I also want to talk to you about horses because I know horse racing and horses are are in your blood. Um, so, so we're going to talk to you. But Ral, tell us in the in the post auction alliance days, what has your life looked like? Yeah, so at the beginning, I just spent a lot of time feeling sorry for myself, and then, I, as I said earlier, I sort of changed my my view and um I, I went to study which is something i wanted to do and um i suppose that was my previous dog time I, I went to i was very lucky i went to ucla i, I did a master's degree in, in california i then did another one in, in singapore and i came back to south africa i i, I just I, I could have actually immigrated at that point i mean everybody said i, I should have um and uh I, I was thinking about it but i decided that i didn't want to leave south africa with that sort of stigma uh, of having run away and also having had unfinished business in South Africa. And so I came back home. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in South Africa. I know we spend our days discussing this, but I, I came back simply because I knew it was a place where I did have friends. And so I, I started a business in 2017 uh, called InnoSpace. Um, initially, it was tough going. In fact, only, uh, you know, as, as Greg said, years before, banks had loved me. I'd done work for every bank in South Africa. It was only Investec Bank who punted me at that point. And that's why I always punt them because um, they really did stand by me. And I, I started the company. Uh, we, we sort of took industrial parks. We created a, a, um, a, a new concept in, uh, in industrial parks. We called them service logistics parks. And uh, it built up into a large business. Within three, four years, it had built up to a three billion rand company, um, which was quite ironic for me because that was roughly 10 times the value of, of what Innerspace was. And it's when, when it closed, it was valued at 300 million um and so i i totally uh, the, the value that auction alliance was oh, sorry auction alliance, sorry, auction and, alliance. And, and and the new yeah. business is called inner space 
new business called Inner Space. We, we own parks, uh, industrial parks or logistics parks all around South Africa. Um, I, I found like navigating the waters really, I, I came back the second round time much wiser, smarter, more humble. In fact, believe it or not, I kept very low profile. In the beginning, I, I, I was allowed to be because I, mean, I had no sanction, but I, I, I didn't even want to be the CEO of this company. But uh, I couldn't help myself. I sort of took up the, 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 the reins again. Um, in, in COVID, we, we doubled the size of the business. I did a very large transaction with uh, Fortress REITs. Um, I, I had the backing of uh, um, Jonathan Bear and Buffett Investments. They, they backed me. They'd been in business with me before. Um, we grew these the parks. And then, of course, in 2020, in the midst of COVID, uh, together with uh, my mate Gedon Novik, we started Lyft Airlines. So, um, you know, when I look back now, in, in the post period, I'm going like, I would have never had that opportunity. I mean, I often think to myself, I wake up in the morning, I wonder if I just taken that cup of coffee, which Wendy Applebaum offered me, where would I be? Um, and I suppose I would be in, uh, I'd be, punt, you know, running around and explaining people on this line about ghost bidding and get vendor bidding. But uh, it's been a great reinvention for me. And, um, and you know, if, if I look back, I actually like it. It's, it's, it's a great story to tell. So uh, for me, the, this coming back actually, was something which I had navigated and plotted and thought about and really concentrated on how to to have a, a um, you know I just think it's an amazing thing and I think it's a actually I have to say it's it's a Jewish thing you know the the ethos of being Jewish is that ability to reinvent yourself and I mean if you simply just look at like the state of Israel and how and and, and just look at how a country with faces so much adversity we, we are a people. We have suffered thousands of years of adversity, but yet the more adversity we have, the more we have the ability to come back. And for me, that was the greatest lesson. And to say, okay, I can't do it this way, but certainly I can come back. I can reinvent myself. And, you know, you used that question earlier on uh, how like, people can judge. And the truth is I started looking at all those comments and then I decided, you know, that I, I don't care what people say and what I judge. To me, the greatest revenge of what happened at this place was having a, a life well lived. And, and doing something which is creative and something which I enjoy doing. And, and to me, that was, to me, if that's the ultimate story of what happened, then I, people often ask me, what would I say to Wendy Applebaum if I ever met her? Because I've never met her. I would simply say, thank you, Wendy, because you allowed and gave me the opportunity to reinvent myself. And so um, most people are surprised when I say that. But I, 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 looking back now, I would have never wanted to go through what, what I did. Uh, I'm sure Greg believes the same. But, but but looking back, it's certainly been a, a great comeback for me, a great reinvention. And and I learned about myself, and I learned that I have the ability to to actually do something twice in two completely different industries. So I'm going to ask everyone who's watching us on Zoom, on YouTube, and on Facebook, please. If you have any questions, this is a great time to post into the chat on any of those platforms, and we'll make sure we can put as many of those questions or comments to, to our panelists as possible. Greg, you fought a nine-year battle with cancer, yeah, and yet, yet you remain positive and strong. Tell us how it's going. Well, first of all, listen, everyone, everyone has their own journey, and everyone handles disease differently. But the way I am is that I refuse to, to see any negativity in anything. So sadly, my cancer battle started just as we got to Cape Town. Uh, it ended up being cancer of the kidney, which um, I thought were kidney stones at the time. And when I got rushed to hospital, I couldn't, I couldn't weed, which was very sad. Uh, they took me in and I said to the doctor, I've got kidney stones, the that he said, let's first have a scan. And they had the scan and he came back and I was with my wife. And he said, I've got good and bad news. And he said, the good news is you haven't got kidney stones. So I thought, well, how bad can the rest of the news? He says, you've got a mess. I said, well, just take it out. And I felt my wife squeezing my hand. Like it's almost like all, all, all the light had been drained out of her body. But the way I am was I said, well, let's get on with it. So they drained the blood out of it. It's a long story. You don't have to go into it. Uh, came out of the hospital the next day. Thursday, I went, had my kidney taken out. Sunday, I was back home. Uh, 10 days later, I was back up and doing whatever I had to do, which was fine. Going for scans every three months, everything was clear. So I went for um, a scan eight months later, and the doctor calls us in, and you know, you must know one thing, when the doctor doesn't look at you in the eye, you know something's not right. And he said to me, we found two nodules on your aorta, and he's spoken to the world surgeons, and 
we can't operate and if we do operate you're going to die and you're going to bleed out and i said well what's the worst result doc and he said to me well we don't know we can try i said no the worst result is you die and that's probably the biggest lesson that i can tell anyone is when you know what the worst result is everything else is upside because how bad can it get and i speak to people daily about cancer they phone me how do they do it what should they do what shouldn't they do and the first thing i say guys i'm not a doctor but you've got to believe 80 percent of it's in your mind so anyway to cut a long story short i landed up having stereotactic radiation which is very advanced radiation and a nuke the chew nodules and once again i was back on the treadmill and going and everything was fine you know walking running doing gym and had a random blood test and my PSA was too high. Once again, the cycle starts, go to the guy and he says, you've got prostate cancer, which is totally unrelated. So now I'm thinking, you know, and everyone tells you about prostate cancer, you know, you could become incontinent, incontinent uh, forget about having sex in, in, in a lift because it just ain't going to happen, you know, and they tell you all the negatives. But the positive is, is that if you want to live, we're going to take it out. So guess what? A year later, I'm back having a, a prostatectomy with this unbelievable machine called the Da Vinci machine, which is done all robotically. Got into hospital on a Thursday, Saturday I was out with a catheter for 10 days, and I've gone forward ever since. I still have treatment. Uh, I've been on immunotherapy for the last nearly two years. I have my last treatment uh, next month, and hopefully that's it. But regardless of the fact, cancer is another journey which you have to adapt to and you have to go forward. And just the same as jail or like rail starting a new venture, it's part of your life. And if you don't do it, you die. That's a simple. I, I walk into the chemo room and I can see the people that are going to be there the following three weeks. You can see that lack of despair in their eyes, the desperation. And it, it, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant sight, but you can see the people who will survive. And as rail said, whatever adversity that you're faced with, it gives you a chance to reinvent yourself, okay? Now, cancer is not something that I wish on anyone because it's just really a debilitating disease, but it doesn't have to be a death sentence. And the same as, you know, let's take the jail out of the equation because the jail is a totally different issue. But when you're faced with health issues, that's, that really surmounts everything else because people say, oh, I give all my money away for my health. And the people who haven't, you've got health, say, so I wish I had some money. The trick is you can't trade backwards in whatever you do. And most people are behind bars. They just don't realize it. So when you face with something that's a death, that becomes a death sentence, and remember, we're all going to die. The trick is how do you handle it? How do you manage it? How do you go forward? Because, you know, coming back to, you know, and, and it's the weirdest thing. that People come up to me and say, Greg, how are you? And I'll say, I'm fine. I'm 100%. And they say, but are you sure? And I said, sure, I'm sure. People don't know how to handle that bad news or that adversity. And no matter how bad I might have been feeling, I always presented that positive side. And that's the only way that I know how to go through life. You have to be positive. If you, if you listen to what Rail said, that at first he was very worried about what people thought. And he couldn't go anywhere and he tried to be low key. But at the end of the day, okay, that's not who he is. He's a leader. You know, whether you like to accept it or not, that's what people do. And some people can't be in the background. I'm not good at being in the background. I mean, I take chances. I have my head cut off. But, you know, there's a nice saying, the tall tree catches the wind. And I'm just not happy to be mediocre, no matter what I do, whether it's trying to help someone with cancer or my coffee club or my walking club or my swimming team. You know, I enjoy the energy of people and I put in as much as I get. And it's been, it's, it's been a great journey, not always filled with um, lots of highs, lots of lows, but the bottom line, how it is that I'm here, you know, and that's what it's all about. The same as, uh, as, as you can tell with rail is that he's going nowhere and he's building something, which is quite remarkable. So, Greg, uh, we, we're still going to talk about horses and life lessons in a, in a few moments. But I, I we had coffee together. In, 
<laughs> we we had uh, coffee together in Cape Town two weeks ago, I think it was, and that was the first time we had sat down together. And uh, I must tell you, when you're with Greg, you are the only person in the room. There is an intensity and an engagement like you feel. I, and I still said to you at the time, what is it that makes Greg Blank Greg Blank, because this is so unique. The waiter arrives, you've already read the waiter's na name tag. You greet the person by name. Every time the waiter came to the, the, the table, you had a conversation with the waiter. There's a human engagement that is really quite unique that you don't find amongst many, many people. And uh, and we're going to come back with life lessons, and I need to to throw in horses because I think horses are really important important yeah. in this discussion. But Rail, give us some life lessons. Tell us, <laughs> tell so, us what you've learned. I guess I mean it, it, it's quite interesting. I mentioned it earlier on. So right in the beginning, when I when I was going through that early like media tsunami, and um, I really didn't know whether it, it would morph into into criminal prosecution. Uh, a common friend actually said I must meet Greg Blank, and um, and uh, I did. And in fact, I, I, I mean, I thank you, Greg. I've told him this before. Before we, uh, I know you were already living in Captain. We met at Hyde Park, and he gave me some brilliant lessons. In fact, I arrived with a notebook, and I, I kept that notebook for years. So I, I truly think you can learn from people who went through adversity. And I, and I listen. I took a lot of advice from Greg, and and the one was actually what people think, um, because he said just you know, the, and I, I you know I remembered and I quoted it often. It was he said, look. You know, you've got, and Greg, maybe you can uh, sort of quoting what you said to me. He said, look, you know, 10% of people will love you because they're your family. And no matter what you do, wrong or right, they will still love you. 10% um, of people will hate you because they either hate the color of your face or your eyes or they, they've had some bad experience. And for 80% of people, you're just a passing story. Um, and, you know, the next day they're going to have a fight with their wife and kick the dog. And so the truth is if 90% of people either are, are sort of benign on you or like you, then why worry about the 10%? And that advice that Greg gave me at the time, and you know, he also taught me to gave me some good advice, and because it's so difficult, because I've never to, to talk to somebody who'd been through a sort of scandal and how to reinvent yourself. So, I mean, certainly in terms of of, of life lessons, um, you know, there are many. Uh, uh, again, you know, I, I sort of in, in the book right at the end. I, I don't want to be the dispenser of business advice. I think it's it's a bit arrogant, um, but I do talk about how to deal. With the tsunami, if you if you deal with it, my first lesson is like if the there we go, thank you. I always say, you know, my first lesson is like, you know, calm the fuck down is like the was my first lesson. And even if you're not calm, to just pretend to to calm down. Um, I, I think that was a, it's a big lesson. I think a, a huge lesson is that we all have ups and downs in life, um, and we all have surprises. And whether with surprises, like sadly, whether it's it's, it's a health crisis or whatever crisis, whether it's load shedding, whether it's the, the COVID-19. I think the great surprise about life is that we're surprised that we think we're not going to have surprises. So we're all going to have surprises. I mean, we, we like to we, we like to believe that the world is perfect and we're all going to lead these perfect lives and we're going to live the life which we plan and the life which we which we want to live. But suddenly things happen. And I think when when the, the greatest lesson is to develop a set of tools to go when those things happen, you know, what are the, what are my values? What do I believe in? And, uh, and, you know, Greg, I never thought it that way. I mean, the, the truth is that uh, I, I suppose I wasn't really designed to be in, in the background. And I also like to give everything uh, my, my, great, my greatest attempt. But for me, it's a lot about, it's about being positive. And, and it's not easy being positive. You know, I wish I, I had all the answers, but, it, but certainly to try to be positive and, um, and to look at the best in, the, in, in every situation. And, you know, I, I recently went to a, a Jewish fundraising event in Cape Town and, and you know, one of the people stood up and said, listen, no, we can look at all the negatives about South Africa, but but we live here and we're here and our children are here and we've got schools here. So at the end of the day, we have a choice. We either can just be negative and we all become a self, uh, we become a, we all create actually the environment because we're so negative or we just get up in the morning every day and we put a smile on our dial and we carry on doing what we're doing and we incrementally grow and we incrementally improve and we try as much as possible to do the right thing um, and to to lead lives which are worth living, and to me those are, are the greatest lessons. Um, obviously, there, there are many more. Um, I think having sort of a solid base of, of friends and supporters and family is is really important, and um, and really just to to to. Uh, and and I've, I've actually sort of since the I was very nervous about bringing up the book, by the way, and I literally the week before I, I didn't want to do it because I had a whole. I had a whole crowd of PR people came and they sat around my table and said, look, be prepared for bad PR. In fact, 
By the way, even before your talk, I had a few people phoning me and say, just be aware of bad PR. You know, people are going to write nasty comments on, on the Jewish report about you and your association with Greg, and it's like a stupid idea. And why are you doing that? And I and I literally just before this talk, I, I walked to the room and I thought, is this a bad idea? Am, am I am I associating in, in the wrong environment? But then I thought, you know what? I would rather if somebody could pick up like the lesson of adversity, and no matter how cut things are and how bad things are, there always is an option. You always have choice, even if you are behind uh, um, behind the trolleys. At, at, you do have choice, and the choice is the way you perceive them. And if you can perceive them positively, they will be positive. The outcome can be positive if you can if you can see it. And I've never suffered a, a health threat, and I. I don't know what I would do in those circumstances, but certainly my greatest lesson is that you truly are the master of your own destiny. And no matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets, so many people said to me, don't, you will never get back into business. Uh, you will never be able, no one will ever trust you again. And, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, a year ago, when I did this large deal with, um, with, with Fortress REIT, I, I went for a run around Johannesburg. I, I write in the book, running is a big, metaphor for me about goal planning and I went on and I went like fuck is this like my story it's like wow who could have had like that that was an exciting story and I I literally ran around and I cried all the way because I thought like wow it's like to to go through that sort of adversity to come to bounce back but the truth is many people do it mine was probably just more high profile many people bounce back from adversity and I, I think that's the ultimate lesson and and we all have adversity in life. We just have different adverse, adversity, and and it's how how we approach it. I suppose we out there characters. Our adversity just got well reported. <laughs> you know, I, it, I'm just smiling a lot because I must tell you, over the last week, I've taken enormous flack from people for putting this webinar together, and I've. I've received abuse. People wanted to know how much you guys were paying me. And all I can say is if you'd like to, I'm willing to accept. But when I'm watching the really comments come for a cup of coffee this hour, <laughs> I don't know about you, but Harvey, next time you come to Cato, I'll pay you in a cappuccino. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people are, are keep on uh, mentioning the word inspiring because I think each of us in our everyday lives face adversity and overcome one crisis or another and we live to fight another day. And that's the great lesson that I think both of you have taught us today. So, Greg, tell us about racehorses. You can't, you can't leave a topic that you're so passionate about without give what does it mean for you? What do you learn from, from the exhilaration of having how many horses do you have, by the way? Not a lot any. I used to have a lot. Uh, but let, let's I just wanted just just one thing before we start racehorses. For me, negativity is a wasted emotion, okay? And quite frankly, it doesn't exist for me. So to anyone out there who, it's so easy to be negative. And what Rail said as well, we're living in South Africa. If you, if you want to open your mouth, then change it. You know, there's one thing I've learned. If you don't worry about things you can't change, worry about things you can. So horse racing for me started with, with my late father. Um, he was a, an avid punter, a bad punter, and he loved owning horses. And it took him 10 years to have his first winner. It was called Top Class, which he led in and then found out that they'd lost the race. And I swore I would never, ever get into racing. And I hooked up with who became my greatest friend. Uh, I won't mention his name and another great friend. And they started a syndicate called the Tawny Syndicate. Uh, that was in 1985, and um, it was named after a horse which they held called Tawny Run, which could only run for 800 meters and then stopped. Uh, sadly, there was only one 800 meter race. But through horse racing, I learned that things aren't always as smooth as, as they might appear. But the thrill of owning a horse and winning a horse is just something which you can't describe to anyone in life. You must understand the very few things that, where you can buy success. The one is horses. The one is owning uh, a Formula One racing team. Or if you have enough money, you can own a soccer club. But in our little way, racing gave us, and we've had a lot of success, an unbelievable understanding of people. Horse racing people are fantastic. You know, meeting people from different walks of life are fantastic. And the biggest lesson for me is that the horse is the common denominator doesn't matter how much money you have or you don't have or how important you are, you aren't. The horse does the talking. So 
It's something which I've been very passionate with over the last 40 years. Um, maybe something in hindsight I wish I wasn't that passionate about because, you know, I'm not allowed to look at how much money it's actually cost me. But the success and the enjoyment that it gives me is something which if people aren't in horse racing will never, ever understand. And it also brought me a lot of people that I never would have met. And as I said to you earlier, I enjoy people. And I, I get my energy and my inspiration from other people. That's how I survive. But owning a horse, and we're happy to include anyone in horses if they want to come in. It's not for the faint-hearted. And it teaches you about failure because very seldom that a horse actually wins. So you learn about failure early on in life. Well, you get up, you get up tomorrow. People keep on uh, posting comments. Like these are the sort of people who should be inspiring the nation. I know a friend of mine who I bumped into yesterday said when he was diagnosed with cancer, Greg was one of the first people who called him and gave him advice and it helped him go, go on. And thank goodness he lives a fantastic life together with the disease. You must mentor a lot of people as well. And, and with within the community you live cape town's a very special place and it's also a small little village within that community cape town is building something special and unique and that next sunday we're going to be talking to your mayor greg and rail both your mayors about how do you build a world-class city but you've also built business empires so if you would impart to the entrepreneurs who are listening to us if you'd impart a message to those entrepreneurs about what it takes in a society which is, is difficult, but what it takes to go and build multiple empires one after it, another, what do you tell the people who you mentor? Yeah, I mean, the, I'll, I'll say two things. I mean, the first thing Greg touched on the issue. I think that failure is, is a great teacher. Um, and I think if you, if you ask any great entrepreneur, they, they will tell you about all their failures. And, you know, to, you know, there are so many people who have You've really learned from failing. You can learn from the failure of others as well. But certainly for me, the, 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 it, it, entrepreneurially, it sort of comes to, to the issue of like of, of tenacity and having that ability just to go out there and take risk. And, and, and you know, they say that risk and luck are, are, are the first cousins of each other because we have good luck, we have bad luck. There are many people, that it's very easy to sit here and judge and say, this is about Greg or that about me and, and, and sit in judgment of people. But the fact is that despite the judgment, to have the balls to wake up the next morning and to take risk and to grow things and to have the tenacity and the patience to see it through, uh, to me, that's, that's the greatest thing. It's to take action. And, um, and to go against the prevailing thoughts and the prevailing wisdom and to just wake up the next morning and to keep going, to have a simple, to have a goal plan, to do it one step at a time, to be patient, and really to, to just look at the world and see things differently. And I think for me, failure has taught me that I've, I've always been innovative to an extent because I look at things differently. I, I, I look at the trends and the prevailing trends in the world and and I take risk. And I think even living in South Africa is risk. And I often ask my question, would I have even been able to build what I built in South Africa anywhere else in the world? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But I think to me, it's about tenacity. It's about perseverance. It's about learning every day. It's about waking up every morning and sort of pressing the, the buttons and, okay, I had a bad day yesterday. Let's go out and, and redo it. And seeing it that actually ultimately you have a vision and really that you have a set of values, the things that you believe in. And uh, to me, one of the things I believe in, I just want to leave things off better than how I found it. So whatever business I go into, I go, how can I just make this better? How can we become better every single day? How can we provide a service that nobody else is providing? And, and that should really be my entrepreneurial message. Um, and again, I'm, I'm cautious of being given an entrepreneurial message because we come from a community of the most outstanding, incredible innovators and business people and entrepreneurs. And it's one of the amazing things about being Jewish is that we come from that environment. And in many ways, I just wish that so many of the entrepreneurs would talk out and give those amazing lessons, which they've taken all around the world. So I'm in no position to, to sit and give, give lectures on how to be great entrepreneurs. There are, are many more who, who are far greater than me. But certainly to me, it's about tenacity and, and taking risks and taking the chances. And when we take that risk, it can slap us in the face. And I know that. And things happen. And um, surprises, as I said, is, is, but, it's, but it's just having the balls 
to go out there and make it happen, despite what the critics say, despite what the prevailing thoughts are, despite the negativity, that you just go out there and you make it happen. And you put on your tackies every day and you hit those pavements and you go running. It's uh, 9 p.m. South Africa time. We've been talking to each other formally for two hours and informally to, for two hours and 15 minutes. And apparently tomorrow is a school day. Uh, so we have to let people go to sleep. But I, I just want to read you one comment. And I'm going to ask people who haven't left us a comment, please, just to take this moment and to leave us a comment, whether you're on Zoom, whether on you're on YouTube, whether you're on, on Facebook, just leave a comment. We'd love to hear what you thought about tonight. But I just want to read one comment that came from someone. And he's, this person says, my respect to both these men who are judged before this webinar. To redeem yourselves the way you both have, I take my hat off to both of you. It's not easy to come in front of your own community and face your community and say, I did wrong. I messed up, but I paid my dues. And now I need to get on with my life. And I think tonight has been one of those great inspirational moments for so many people who've watched us in South Africa and around the world. I pay huge respect and thanks to both of you for an amazing, inspiring evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. And please remember to everyone watching, we'll be back next Sunday evening with the mayor of Cape Town, Gordon Hildus. He's going to be talking about how do we build a world-class city. We'll see you then. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good night, Greg. Good night, Ray. Good night, thank you. It's Good been night. a great, great privilege.